The following is a presentation of the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Hello and welcome back into the Waynesburg University Sports Network pregame show. We'll be bringing you coverage of Waynesburg University football versus Carnegie Mellon University. I'm Riley Holsinger and I'm joined alongside Tanner Saprosky and Adam Morganti. First, we'll be discussing the Jackets' 66 to nothing loss against their I-79 rival, the Washington and Jefferson Presidents. And then we'll talk about the other game happening in the PAC tonight as W&J will host Geneva. And then we'll preview and predict the matchup between Waynesburg and Carnegie Mellon. It's been a long layoff since we've last seen Waynesburg University football as the PAC pushed fall sports to the spring. This past Friday, Waynesburg hosted W&J in the backyard brawl. Rachel Pellegrino has more on that. 16 months, 496 days, and one pandemic later, and the Waynesburg Yellow Jackets are finally taking this field again for their season opener against W&J. Despite starting the season with 16 new starters on both sides of the ball, Waynesburg came out strong. I think we ran the ball well. We came out, and like I said, we played pretty well at the beginning. But that momentum didn't last long. Washington and Jefferson took the lead early in the game and didn't look back. Scoring touchdown, after touchdown, after touchdown. Waynesburg went for it on fourth down six times and the team only converted once. Yellow Jackets head coach Chris Smithley's explanation. That was our strategy. That was our mindset and, and you know what, I'll do it. I'll do it 10 times over the same way. After the first quarter, the Presidents were up 21 to nothing. Leading the charge was quarterback Justin Haycock, who completed 17 of his 22 attempts for 201 yards and four touchdowns. After being down 42 in the second quarter, Smithley knew the Yellow Jackets had to make a change. We needed to play Tyler Reigns in this game. And that they did. Mason Schrankner started the game, but he didn't finish it. Smithley went to Reigns to finish the last two and a half quarters. But Reigns didn't provide the Yellow Jackets with the spark they needed. The Division I transfer only completed 13 of his 28 attempts for 95 yards. Assisting Reigns were Waynesburg's Brennan Tavaric and Howie Metzger, who were able to catch three passes each. But that didn't compare to WJ's leading receiver, Andrew Wolf, who caught eight passes, 112 yards, and two touchdowns. Got good receivers. You know, they're, they're a good football team. With the president's star quarterback and receivers, WJ was able to blow Waynesburg out 66 to nothing. Despite the defeat, Smithley is optimistic about their next game on Thursday when they'll host Carnegie Mellon. We're gonna we're gonna be short memory and we're gonna take it to the next week and and we're gonna keep improving. For WCTV, I'm Rachel Pellegrino. Thank you, Rachel. Let's talk about the game from Friday night. It was not a pretty one whatsoever from Waynesburg. Adam, a lot of things went wrong in that game for Waynesburg. What were some of the main ones that you pointed out? One one thing I don't look at has possession down battle between Waynesburg and WJ. You look at the opening drive for Waynesburg. They had success running the ball. Then they got to a fourth and seven. They were just past midfield in WJ territory. And it was a fourth and seven. They, ha they did a running play to Hall, and he barely got any yards. Then you look at the first drive for WJ. They faced a fourth and goal from the 11-yard line in they were able to convert on that as Justin Heacock found Andrew Wolf for his first receiving touchdown on the opening drive on fourth down. So W&J was able to take possessions of third, fourth downs as W&J, they were four of 10 on third downs and four of five on fourth downs compared to Waynesburg being five and 19 on third downs and one of six on fourth downs. And that, that really was a big issue for why W&J was able to have a blowout victory was those possession downs compared to W&J and Waynesburg for how good W&J was compared to Waynesburg, how they weren't so successful. As we saw in that story by Rachel there, uh, Coach Smithley said that was the strategy why he decided to go for it on fourth down six times in that game. And I think that's kind of what you needed to do in that game against Washington and Jefferson as well because it's tough to go out there and beat a team that plays at the level of caliber that Washington and Jefferson does year in and year out. Tanner, what were some of the noticeable um, things that Waynesburg did wrong that uh, struck out to you? Yeah, I agree with Adam that fourth downs and you got to be aggressive, like you were saying, Riley, to beat a team like the Washington and Jefferson presidents. For me, as watching that entire game, the thing that really stuck out to me is the 
we, the Waynesburg's offense was so one-dimensional the entire game that it couldn't get anything going. Uh, they, they ran the ball early on, and it was pretty successful the first two drives of the game with Nick Hall, who's not normally the starting running back, but he did a good job at least at the beginning of the game. But Waynesburg ran the ball 39 times and only came away with 59 rushing yards. That's just not... You need a good running game to set up a good passing game, and that's just not get it, not going to get it done. Passing yards, Waynesburg only had 106 out of two quarterbacks. So I think Waynesburg needs to find ways to move the ball better, more efficiently, so you don't have to get to those fourth downs or those long third downs. So for me, Waynesburg's offense just needs still stay aggressive, but find a way to move the ball side to side down the field and and at least just try to switch it up on offense a little bit. Out of those 39 attempts, Nick Hall ended up having 15 of those attempts for 42 yards. He was kind of the, the bell cow back for Waynesburg in this ball game. But Adam, how big was it that they didn't have Justin Flack in action? Oh, it was huge. It was Justin Flack was probably Waynesburg's best player last year as a freshman, but he is probably going to be back for this game, which is huge. He provides that experience, even though it was only one year as he's a sophomore this year. But, yeah, he's a very good runner. I like his style of running. Waynesburg will definitely be happy that he'll be back. And th they missed him, I could tell for sure. Nick Hall did have some good and effective runs, but he's not Justin Flack. Justin Flack was, is a very effective runner, and you'll see that tonight for this game against Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, Nick Hall, he definitely had an admirable performance, in my opinion, on the ground, especially filling in for Flack. But not only Flack, you look at the top three rushers for Waynesburg last season. They didn't have Flack in that game. They didn't have Chad Walker, who graduated, and they didn't have Jordan Taylor, who left. So losing those three were definitely uh, big pieces to the offense for the last year. So Hall definitely had to step up tremendously for Waynesburg in that ball game. Uh, Tanner, how can Waynesburg right the ship? This is a pretty quick turnaround to play against Carnegie Mellon uh, tonight. Yeah, going back to the offense, I mean, they just, they got to be efficient. They got to move the ball. And as you mentioned, guys leaving, they got to find more chemistry with this team. And I think it starts with who's allegedly going to start this game tonight. Tyler Raines, the quarterback for Waynesburg, the, the Townsend transfer, his first year with the team. He didn't throw a pass at Townsend, but you know, playing with a D1 squad, you got to pick up some things, especially as a backup quarterback. You can really learn a lot. And he came in f during the W&J game for Mason Shrinker. Didn't do all that well, but there were some bright spots. He looked comfortable back there despite being pressured most of the game. He had a couple nice completions. He finished 13 for 28 with only 95 yards. But again, Waynesburg's offense, not a big throwing threat. So I think if he can get comfortable under center and in the shotgun and with this offense and the team as a whole, I think that's where it's going to start for Waynesburg, but it's definitely going to take a lot of work if they want to compete with one, some of these stronger teams in the President's Athletic Conference. The passing attack didn't pose as a threat to uh, uh, W and J when you look at the statistics. Tyler Raines only um, 95 yards going 13 for 28, and he threw an interception as well. When you look at W and J's passing stats, it was a completely different ball game. WJ's backup quarterback, Colton Jones, went 5 for 9 with 99 yards and a touchdown. That was more yards than Waynesburg's leading passer in that ballgame. So that just goes to tell you uh, the success that WJ had through the air. And then you look at quarterback Justin Haycock, who filled in for Justin Adams and played admirably 17 for 22, 201 yards and four touchdowns. But Adam, how big was it for uh, WJ to get back Andrew Wolf? one of the top leading receivers in Division Three. Oh, it was huge. You saw it on the first play of the their first drive for W&J. It was a long pass to Andrew Wolf, and let, later they finished the drive with his first receiving touchdown. He had two on the day. He had eight receptions for 112 yards and two touchdowns in that game. So they definitely missed him last year. W&J missed out on the PAC title, but he is back, and he's going to be a force for any quarterback that faces him in the PAC this year. He's going to have a monster year, in my opinion. And part of the, the success for not only injury, but the entire passing game for W&J was Waynesburg got no pass rush whatsoever. They did not touch Justin Heacock. They, Waynesburg did not have a single sack in that game. Now, yeah, they have a lot of new guys on both sides of the ball, and that really had something to do with it. But Waynesburg pa Waynesburg's pass, pass rush has to be way better than it was this past Friday, or else quarterbacks are going to have an easy field day and be able to write a poem or something back there for how much time they're going to have 
back like he clocked it. Because on, on that first touchdown, Wayne's group had good coverage, but he had forever. He had all day to throw. He was able to step up in the pocket. And your corners can't cover for that long. So really, that's why Wolf was able to get open because he clocked out all the time of the world. So really, that was the key for how good Andrew Wolf was in the entire passing attack for WJs because Wayne's group just... Didn't have a pass rush. One of the big things that um, attributed that is Waynesburg is starting 16 uh, new starters on both sides of the ball. So a lot of players were being replaced on defense from last season when we look at it. Tanner, how big was that to show the inexperience of Waynesburg by only returning six starters to its roster? Yeah, you could really tell that they're pretty much a new team out there on defense. As Adam mentioned, basically no pressure on the quarterbacks at all in that W&J game. And as Adam mentioned, your corner is just, doesn't matter how good they are, it's going to be impossible to stay on a wide receiver, especially a guy like Andrew Wolf for seven, eight seconds every single drive because you can't get into the backfield. But I think that's definitely where it's going to start on the defensive side of the ball for Waynesburg. They didn't have a sack, didn't cause a turnover. And if your offense is struggling, those are two key things that your team needs, especially if you're trailing in a ball game or trying to stay competitive. All right, quickly here, Tanner. Can you point out one positive thing that happened in this game from Waynesburg? Let's get away from all the negative talk about the game. Despite being down by a lot the whole game, they, they really truly didn't give up on the offense and defensive side of the ball. No matter who was on the field, they really, they really came out and played and played the whole entire game. Adam, what's your uh, positive note of the game? I'm going to say their rushing defense. It was pretty good. They gave up over 172 yards rushing, which is 4.9 per carry for how many attempts w &J had. But I still saw a lot of good things from their rushing defense. Their starting running back, Joey Caroli, only had five carries for 25 yards and one touch. And that one touchdown was on a 21-yard carry. So they really shut him down. So my positive is Waynesburg's rushing defense, which I think will continue to have success throughout the season. They were very good last year in rushing defense, and I think that continue that will continue to happen this year. Head coach Chris Smithley said after the game on Friday that his team needed to have a short memory after the big loss. We'll find out come game time if Waynesburg has a short memory and comes out to defeat Carnegie Mellon, or if we'll see something similar to last week's game when they lost 66 to nothing against W and J. When we come back on the Waynesburg University Sports Network pregame show, we'll be previewing the W&J versus Geneva game. We just mentioned the Waynesburg and Washington Jefferson game from last Friday. Tonight, the Presidents are playing the only other Presidents Athletic Conference game against Geneva. W&J is coming into this game at 1-0, while Geneva is winless at 0-1. Let's talk about the Presidents first, Tanner. How tremendous is it for W&J to go from a star quarterback in the PAC and Jacob Adams to a guy in Justin Haycock who pretty much just looked like Adams out there, if not better? Yeah, I mean, the first game, it's definitely tough to judge, especially against this Waynesburg defense, who was just a, a giant hole the entire game, rushing attack, the passing attack. But um, Justin Haycock did play very well. He was eventually taken out of the game because of the big lead, but he did finish 17 for 22, 201 yards, and four passing touchdowns. He added 30, just about 30 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown. So he did play very well, and... The biggest thing for me, they did lose Jacob Adams starting um, for, or Justin Haycock starting for him this season. Haycock looked very comfortable in the pocket, scrambling outside of the pocket. I mean, the entire time he was in, there's 22 pass attempts and five carries. He looked like he wasn't nervous at all. He looked very comfortable when he executed mostly every single play that Dub J um, drew up in that game. So I think Maybe later on in the season, it might come back to bite him, but just a small sample size of that first game, I think Justin Haycock played very well. Haycock didn't really see a lot of times for W&J being behind uh, Jacob Adams. Adam, how did Justin Haycock look to you personally as a quarterback for W&J? He looked really good. It didn't look like there was much of a drop-off at all between Jacob Adams and 
Justin Haycock. And not only did he have four uh, passing touchdowns, he also had one rushing touchdown. So he kind of showed his dual threat cap capabilities for his presence offense. And yeah, he looked very comfortable, as Tanner said, scrambling when Waynesburg was able to apply pressure and he was able to find his open man. Very accurate too, being 17 of 22 also helps when you have guys like Andrew Wolf and Peyton Scalos throwing the ball to two very good receivers and definitely the best duo in the PAC. So he looked really good for being a first time starter for me against Waynesburg and he will continue to improve for this W and J offense. You just answered my next question, Adam. I was gonna ask you if you thought there was any wide receiver room in the PAC that would be better um, than Scalos and Andrew Wolf and you're just shaking your head no. Tanner, do you think that there's any wide receiver room in the PAC that amounts to the presidents? I don't think so. I mean Andrew Wolf is just so much of a presence and he takes up so much attention on the field. And even if you double him He's still going to get away from him. He try to play zone a little bit. He's going to be able to find those holes and sit in those pockets and make those tough catches if he has to. So I just think Andrew Wolf really elevates the two of them. But I think to answer your question, I think those two are the best in the conference. The only other wide receiver room that I can compare as close to W&J is Grove City for me. Cameron Jake... Cameron Drake, excuse me, and Cody Gustafson, uh, those two are stellar players for Grove City. Geneva, let's talk about them now. They had a 7 to nothing lead over Westminster early on, but Westminster slammed their foot on the gas pedal and scored 52 unanswered points. What do you guys think uh, went wrong for Geneva in that ball game? Tanner, let's start with you. I mean, coming into the game, Westminster was the better team, and they're going to be one of the better teams in the conference all season long. But um, Geneva getting out to that first touchdown, it definitely helps a lot. I mean, you get your confidence up, but you got to be able to maintain that um, intensity throughout the whole game. And Westminster just came out after that, 52 unanswered points. And for me, the big thing is, uh, with Geneva running the famous triple option, I just don't think that's um, sustainable enough throughout an entire game, especially against one of the better teams in the conference in Westminster. So I think after that first touchdown, first couple drives, Westminster's defense really figured out what, what Geneva was doing, and they were able to stop it pretty effectively. Adam, is there any matchups that you're going to be looking forward to in this game uh, between Geneva and Washington and Jefferson? Yeah, I'd probably say the W and J defense versus the Geneva rushing attack because you saw how good W and J's rushing defense was against Waynesburg. They only gave up 59 yards rushing. Now, Geneva they had 220 yards on 53 attempts, which is 4.2 yards per carry against Westminster. So I expect W and J to be able to shut down the Geneva rushing attack. Again, they. Do not pass the ball at all. Their quarterback, Amos Lubtak, only had two passing attempts. One of those was a passing touchdown, though, to Jake Ford. But W&J's defense, I think, will have its way against the Geneva rushing attack. And the thing with Geneva is, yes, they're a triple option offense mainly. But if their rushing attack doesn't have any success, really, will they try to throw the ball more, a little more? And if they do and surprise W&J, I think that will lead to more success for Geneva. But Geneva, if they come out and run the ball the first few drives and it doesn't work for them, they should try to throw it for them to see if they, they can find more success on offense. The triple option is arguably one of the most predictable offenses for any team to run just in football in general, but it doesn't mean it's an easy one to stop. The triple option still has its moments, and it's honestly a good offense if we're going to talk about trap games. Let's get to prediction time, Tanner. Do you think that Geneva can upset W&J in this trap game, or do you think W&J just runs away with it? Um, I don't know if it's going to be so much of a blowout, especially not as big as the Waynesburg game, but I do think W&J will win this game comfortably just I mean I agree with Adam how if they're able to stop the the triple option stop the Geneva rushing attack and force them to throw they don't throw it a whole lot they don't practice it a whole lot and I mean WJ is one of the best teams out there so I I would trust them trust their defense to be able to stop the running game and kind of control the game at their own pace Adam who do you have in the matchup I also have WJ for um, pretty much what I said earlier, I think they'll be able to stop this Geneva rushing attack and showing for how Geneva got down to as bad as 52-7, to seven, no matter how bad the rushing attack is, 
They're going to stick to their running game. That is their bread and butter. They're going to stick to it. But WJ, I think they're going to have the answers for it, and they're going to be able to shut down the rushing attack. So I like WJ to win this one in a blowout. I said this game might be a trap game, but that's not what I'm thinking. Give me the presidents. Uh, I think WJ is too good right now. They answered every single question that I had for them coming into the game. Uh, head coach Mike Sirianni, he put together a solid program. He recruits well and everything. And it showed last week when WJ defeated Waynesburg 66 to nothing. We have one other game to talk about right here in the President's Athletic Conference, and it's the Waynesburg University Yellow Jackets facing off against the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. But first, we will check in with our announcers, Nicholas Callis and Jack Hillgrove. Well, just because we're playing football in the spring doesn't mean we escape the football weather. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to John F. Wiley Stadium. It's the Waynesburg University Yellow Jackets hosting the Tartans of Carnegie Mellon. Jack Kilgrove alongside Nicholas Callis. Last two, uh, the, these teams coming off of losses last week. Carnegie Mellon's to Grove City by 10 points. Waynesburg's to W and J, a little bit more lopsided. Yeah, both teams struggled on defense. Of course, Waynesburg lost 66 to nothing. Anybody that supports Waynesburg football probably wants to forget about that game and just move on. But CMU struggled on defense as well. CMU had one sack in their game against Grove City. Waynesburg, no sacks. Again, they struggled on defense. But for today, Waynesburg has some optimism. CMU has struggled against Waynesburg. CMU 3-1 and one against Waynesburg, and all those games have been close. And also for Waynesburg, they've got the running back, Justin Flack, back. Yeah, 778 yards last season, four touchdowns. He's running back number one. The 12th man's ready to go behind us. The train rolling by John F. Wiley Stadium. We're ready to go. Waynesburg and Carnegie Mellon. Another one worth noting as well, Waynesburg making a shift to quarterback. Tyler Raines, the transfer from Towson, the Division I level. 13 of 28 last week, 90 yards passing. He gets the start over Mason Schrenker. Yeah, I, I, mean, I talked to him a few times. The, the man seems confident. Uh, and last week against w &J, he got some time playing as well. So this week, uh, hopefully for Waynesburg, uh, they can have a consistent quarterback and they can score because, again, they have not scored any points yet this season. They got shut out against w &J last week. Waynesburg, Carnegie Mellon right here on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Riley and the guys in studio will break down their predictions. You're watching Waynesburg University football on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. We're going to fade up to our camera three in five, four, three, two, one, take it. Now it is time to talk about the matchup the Waynesburg University Sports Network will cover today. Waynesburg takes on Carnegie Mellon. Both of these teams are heading into today's matchup winless. Waynesburg is coming off of a 66 to nothing blowout loss against WJ, while Carnegie Mellon fell to Grove City 24 to 14. Tanner, what are some of the matchups that you are going to be looking forward to tonight between the Tartans and the Yellow Jackets? Yeah, I'm going to go with Tyler Raines. He's allegedly getting the start for Waynesburg tonight against the Grove City defense. Because I, I believe in Raines, that first game against W&J last week, I think he did a not a great job. I mean, he did a pretty, pretty good, had a pretty good game for his first time being with the team, first game. And, you know, with all the COVID restrictions, preseason, um, getting all messed up. So I think if he starts tonight, um, him going out against Grove City, because Grove City, or not Grove City, excuse me, Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon didn't play all that well against Grove City last week. So if Reigns and that Waynesburg offense is able to put some points up on the board, I think it, it could cause some problems for um, Carnegie Mellon because Carnegie Mellon only put up 14 points against Grove City. So if Waynesburg is able to keep it close and make it competitive and get their offense sparked a little bit, I think they could cause some, pro some problems for the Tartans tonight. Adam, what's your matchup to watch for in this ball game? I'm going to say Justin Flack versus the Carnegie Mellon defense. And if Tyler Reigns does start, you have a quarterback there with not much experience playing in the PAC. So you want to rely on that run game. And Justin Flack is 
the perfect guy to do that at running back for Waynesburg. So if if you're able to feed the ball to Justin Flack and he's able to get a couple first downs for you in that opening drive, get some momentum, get get yourself in scoring position, that'll be great for Waynesburg and for Justin Flack as he didn't play in the game against WJ. So if Justin Flack can get off to a good start, that'll spark this Waynesburg offense and I'll get off Waynesburg to a good start in this game. So my key matchup is Justin Flack versus Carnegie Mellon defense. Good matchup. You guys ended up touching up on the roommate duo of Justin Flack and Tyler Reigns. I didn't know if you guys knew about that, that they both roomed together after uh, Reigns transferred in from Towson. But let's talk a little bit more about Reigns because Tanner brought him up. And the thought of having him at quarterback for the Waynesburg University Yellow Jackets is really enticing. You have a guy who had the potential. He ended up going to a small D1 school, D1 FCS Towson. But he's coming here second semester this year. He didn't have a lot of time to get acclimated to the offense and everything. Um, Adam, let me throw this to you since Tanner talked about Reigns a good bit. How enticing is that? Do you stick with a guy in Reigns who has a lot of potential versus a guy in Schranker who we've already seen a lot of? I think we'll have to see, and over these past few seasons, Chris Smithley likes to balance quarter, quarterbacks. You look at Tyler Perone and Jake Dockerty, he liked to mix the playing time. So I don't think this competition is over, even if Reigns does have a great game today, and he'll probably stick with him and start Reigns the next game, but it'll obviously depend on performance, it, and it'll depend on who has... Now it is time to talk about the matchup the Waynesburg University Sports Network will cover today. Waynesburg takes on Carnegie Mellon. Both of these teams are heading into today's matchup winless. Waynesburg is coming off of a 66 to nothing blowout loss against W&J, while Carnegie Mellon fell to Grove City 24 to 14. Tanner, what are some of the matchups that you are going to be looking forward to tonight? Since a couple years ago, you had Perone and Daugherty battling it out for quarterback. Then you had Perone and Schranker battling it out. Now this year, you have Schranker and, um, and Reigns battling it out. So, Tanner, what are some of the keys going to be for both teams to go out there and win this ball game today? Um, I think both teams just got to move the ball well. CMU's offense, not terrible, but last game against Grove City, they, they struggled a lot. They were 1-9 for nine on third downs as... We mentioned earlier about Waynesburg also struggling on third and fourth downs. Uh, CMU last game, they got um, Grove City put up 446 yards total. CMU only 180. Grove City doubled the amount of plays uh, ran against CMU. So I think CMU needs to, needs to click on offense a little bit more, find that chemistry, be able to move the ball if they want to have a chance of being successful in this game. And I think it's the same thing for Waynesburg. That offense is still... A little bit in shambles with Flack coming back, the quarterback controversy. So I think if both offenses are really, if they, if they can figure it out and work as a team better, I think that those are definitely two keys for both those teams in tonight's matchup. Adam, what are your keys for Carnegie Mellon to win and for Waynesburg to win? I'm going to go with both of them on possession downs and third downs. Waynesburg was 5-19 on third downs and 1-6 on fourth downs, but Carnegie Mellon, they didn't have good success either. They were only 1-9 of nine on third downs, and they only had eight first downs for the entire game. So whatever team I think can control the clock and able to get more third down conversions and is able to be on the field longer, get more first downs, I think, will win this game. You look at the time possession for Carnegie Mellon compared to Grove City last game. Grove City had almost... 40 minutes of time of possession compared to Carnegie Mellon had just a little over 20 minutes of time of possession. So I think whichever team will, wins the third down battle will win this game so they can stay on the field longer to have a chance to score. So the third down battle, Riley, is really something I'm looking forward to for the keys for both games between Waynesburg and Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon was in most of the game last week uh, against Grove City. It ended up losing 24-14. to but the game was tied until about the middle of the third quarter. And that's a tough Grove City team to play against. Josh Est, uh, you have Cameron Drake, you have Cody Gustafson. So it, it was a tough battle ball game. And this is a Carnegie Mellon ball team that's returning most of its offensive starters from a year ago from a team that finished 8-3, and three, losing its starting running back and, its, and most of its uh, key defensive players. 
But let's move over to prediction time right now. Tanner, who do you have in this matchup between Waynesburg and Carnegie Mellon? Even though CMU didn't come out, or they came out pretty hot against Grove City, but didn't play to the best of their ability, I don't think. Uh, I think CMU's older. They have more experience on both sides of the ball than Waynesburg. And as I mentioned before, Waynesburg still got to figure out some of the parts, especially on offense with the offensive line, quarterback, and the return of Justin Flack. So I just think CMU, more experienced. I think they're just more talented all around as well. So I have Carnegie, Me Carnegie Mellon winning this game tonight. Adam, who do you have? I think Justin Flack being back in this game will provide a spark for this offense, and the running game will be much improved compared to what it was against w &J, But I still don't think it's enough. Car Carnegie Mellon is just the overall better team compared to Waynesburg. It won't be as big of a blowout as it was Last game, Waynesburg, I think, will be able to put up some points in this game. Justin Flack and Tyler Raines will help with that, but I like Carnegie Mellon to win this game. No Lee Corso references from me in this prediction segment. Give me Carnegie Mellon. After what I saw last week from Waynesburg, uh, there wasn't a, a lot of positives for me to personally pull away from that game and especially head into this matchup against the Carnegie Mellon football team. That is very good. But thank you, Tanner and Adam, for your input on the Waynesburg University Sports Network pregame show. We'll be taking a quick break before we send it down to our announcers for the matchup. Well, we're at John F. Wiley Stadium, Jack Hillgrove alongside Nicholas Callis. As we said in our stand-up, just because it's spring and we're playing football doesn't mean we escape football weather. A crisp 30 degrees in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. The sun set to set in about five or so minutes in the low, probably at the end of the game, around 25 degrees. It's still football weather. Waynesburg takes on the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. Last year, these two teams played. It was in favor of the Carnegie Mellon Tartans by a score of 24-3. to Mason Schranker, the quarterback for Waynesburg, 12 of 21 in that matchup, is uh, not getting the start today. He is... Um, sitting behind Tyler Raines. But the last time these two teams took place on this field, Waynesburg winners, 24-21. to That was on homecoming in 2018. Jack Hillgrove alongside Nicholas Callis. Yeah, and I was at both games uh, over the last two seasons that CMU played Waynesburg. Uh, it was exciting for Waynesburg. I remember uh, when Tyler Perrone was on the team, he was real excited after the game, uh, felt hopeful for Waynesburg football. Last season, however, the 2019 season, uh, was not as great for Waynesburg. Only one win out of ten games. That was against Teal, a team that hasn't won a game in years now. But, uh, I mean, this team right now is still a big question mark, Waynesburg is. I mean, Washington and Jefferson is a notoriously good team, so them losing by as much as they did isn't quite shocking. But in this game, uh, I think they can play better. And Tyler Raines is definitely a wild card for this game as well. He, he didn't start last game. He's starting this game. But he got some playing time last game, and this game is a perfect opportunity for him. Uh, to break out, just to play well and see if he can lead the offense to scoring and then the defense does its job, Waynesburg uh, can play well and compete in this game. Yeah, there you see the Carnegie Mellon Tartans coming out onto the field and it's they're all led by their head coach, Rich Lackner. You saw him right there on your screen in his 34th season. He's been the head man in charge of the Carnegie Mellon Tartans since 1986. Over 200 career wins. Western Pennsylvania Athletics Hall of Fame, a Carnegie Mellon graduate in 1975 and a member of their Athletics Hall of Fame as well. There you see the jackets dressed in orange, led by fourth-year man Chris Smithley, who took over for Rick Shepis, uh, the all-time winningest coach in program history four years ago. The referees meet at midfield. It looks like the jackets have won the toss and elected to receive. So the jackets will move it from left to right. Howard Metzger and Monroe Moeller backed to receive. Waynesburg wore its new uh, black alternate jerseys last week in its traditional home oranges this week. Carnegie Mellon rode whites, gray pants, gray helmets. We're set and ready to go. Waynesburg, Carnegie Mellon. Again, the last time these two teams played on this turf two years ago, Waynesburg winners on homecoming 24-21. to Waynesburg traveled up to Pittsburgh last season, lost 24-3 to to Carnegie Mellon. And it's Hayden Hairston, the sophomore, the one kicking yep. for Carnegie Mellon University. Yep, two for two on point after attempts this season. Hairston, the sophomore, will 
tee it up right at the 35-yard line to our left. Oh, it blows over. It's been windy today. It has been a windy afternoon, uh, calling an audible. Typically, the guys like us at the Waynesburg University Sports Network are up uh, on the scaffolding above the press box. We're in the press box today. Uh, you know, audio concerns, weather concerns, and we wanted to give you the best coverage as possible. Harrison has it teed up, swings a right leg through it, and we're underway. This one is going to be short, and it's going to hit, and it's going to go out of bounds. That's a penalty flag to start this game. Waynesburg University struggled last week with field position. They get some pretty darn good field position to start this game. Going to take it at their own 40-yard line. Yeah, that was uh, Monroe Moeller for Waynesburg, the one who received that. Uh, and it's smart, too. Even if you have one foot out of bounds and then touch the ball, that still counts as a kick out of bounds, which then yields the penalty. So. Tyler Reigns, there he is, number 18, 13 of 28. One interception last week, 95 yards, a long pass of 14 Coming into this season, hadn't played a collegiate game. Committed to Division I Towson. Didn't uh, play all there. And then coming to Division Three Waynesburg, hailing from Columbia, Maryland. What well, we talked about, the availability of Justin Flack. He was listed as running back number one on the two deep released to us. But Nick Hall gets the first carry of the game, who ran it really well last week. Crosses the 35-yard th line for a gain of a couple. Flack, la or rather Hall, last week 15 carries for 42 yards along of 12, averaging 2.8 yards per clip. Getting about... Two yards on that play brings up a second and eight at the Waynesburg 37. And this Carnegie Mellon University defense runs a 3-4 defense and the nose tackle, the six foot two senior 300 pound nose tackle, Skylar Blacker. Look for him to make an impact on the line. Reigns will throw it near side, pass is caught past the 40 and up near the 45 yard line. That's Trenton Kearns, the 5'10", 175 pound junior from Falling Waters, West Virginia. Getting up to the, well, they're going to mark him down at the 42-yard line for a gain of four. That'll bring up a third down and a long, or rather, a long three. And there you see Kearns putting his head down, getting a couple of extra yards. And this is something that Waynesburg didn't do a whole lot of last week. Third and short, they have that right now. And Justin Flack enters the ball game. Yeah, there was a lot of offensive problems for Waynesburg last week. Not a lot of these type of situations, but good sign early in the game. Third and three, gain of five. Handoff, Flack with space. First down and more. Welcome back. The dairy native Justin Flack brings it up midfield. The Jackets have a new set of downs on their first offensive possession of the game. Again, there weren't too many first down conversions either for Waynesburg last week, so this is pretty exciting. Again, And again, a good sign. Justin Flack back of the game. Tyler Reigns completed pass already. Looking up right now. Needed three, got six. Reigns in the gun. We'll hand it off, delayed hand off to Flack, who's got nowhere to go. Back to the line of scrimmage, and that is all. A good job by the Carnegie Mellon defensive front. Looked like Skyler Blacker, the nose tackle. Five tackles last week, the senior from Lake Bluff, Illinois, the first man to him. There you see him on your screen at six foot two, 300 pounds. No gain. Brings up a second and ten. Yeah, it looked like a botched option as well. It looked like Tyler Raines didn't want to put it in the belly of Justin Flack, but Justin Flack kind of clamped down and took it himself for a short gain. Flack last season, 778 yards. Didn't play last week. Raines passed near side almost into the hands of Sean Brennan. But a good job defensively there for the weak side safety, Nick Sizek, the junior from Portland, Oregon. Another thing about Carnegie Mellon, and they are one of the nation's most renowned schools academically. They pull kids from all over the place. Yeah. We'll run through their starting lineup real quick. Austin, Texas, Illinois, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Downingtown, Pennsylvania, California, another Illinois, New Jersey, California, Oregon, Virginia, Connecticut, the starters. Third down and 10. Play action fake. Reigns under pressure, and he's going to go down. Back at the 44-yard line, a good job there of the Carnegie Mellon defensive front. And the first man to him, I believe, was Jake Serwin. Here's the replay on your screen. Yeah, so he ran out of time. Brought down by a couple players. A yeah, good job there, Serwin as well. As Sam Bond, the weak side defensive end. So fourth down and 14, a loss of four yards on the play. And it'll bring... 
the Waynesburg punter into the ball game, Caden Roberts. Short, long snap, but Roberts able to pick it up and boot it away. Fair catch signaled for by the Carnegie Mellon return man. It looked to be Ben Armbester, and he makes the fair catch, and they'll spot the ball at the 31-yard line. No score, 11 minutes, 48 seconds left in the ball game. The Jackets head to defense, and this is the first time we see senior quarterback J.D. Dayhuff into the ball game. Actually, it's not going to be J.D. Dayhuff. Ben Mills, the freshman, into the ball game, starts this one out of the pistol from the Woodlands, Texas. Hasn't completed a pass at all this season, and is a freshman. This is his first time into the ball game, but they're going to hand it off to start the game to Luke Bicklidge. And he's up past the 30, up near the 35-yard line. I'm going to mark him down at the 34. Gain of three on first down. So, what? Carnegie Mellon tossing us a little bit of a curveball. There you see Bicklidge on your screen. J.D. Dayhoff listed as the starting quarterback coming into the ball game, but Ben Mills seeing the first action. Here's Mills on second and seven. Hand it off once more. And this time Bicklidge gets some more yardage. Past the 35 up to the 37 yard line. Brings up a Waynesburg third down. Caleb Stevens on the stop. There you see him on your screen. Number 91, the senior from New Brighton. Also a good job of the sophomore from Moon, Sean Hitler. Number 63. Third down and three. At the Carnegie Mellon 38-yard line, 10.45 left in quarter number one. No score. Waynesburg and Orange, Carnegie Mellon in its home whites. Rather, road whites, I should say. Used to saying home whites from announcing basketball. It was a pass from Mills. His first collegiate pass is complete to Armbrester. Pass midfield, shaking a couple of tacklers. And Ben Armbrester, the junior from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Gets the Tartans a new set of downs. Ben Mills, welcome to collegiate football, one for one. There's the replay on the screen. Yeah, well executed pass. Armbruster kept his balance, stayed in bounds, and found a way to gain a few extra yards. Yep, shaking off first. Vinny San Martino and Connor Hudson in the secondary. Gets past midfield into the Waynesburg territory at the 48. This time Mills in the pistol. And off, flags fly all over the place. This one more than likely coming back. Bicklidge, 40-30, out of bounds. And if I had to take a guess, this one's going to go against Carnegie Mellon. The head referee, Timothy Barker, explains. Legal formation, too many men in the backfield for the Tartans. There you see Timothy Barker on your screen. Paul Simkovich, the umpire. Jacob Hartman, the head linesman. David Papich, the line judge. The back judge, Eric Hermick. The field judge, Mark Packrell. The side judge, Matthew Ridgeway. Clock operator number one, Don Woodward. Clock two, Robert Gaylor. So a five-yard penalty brings it back to first and 15 for the Tartans. And Waynesburg catches a break there because Bicklidge busted off a big run. Yes, he did. That's not even a, an issue on Carnegie Mellon there other than the formation. No holding or anything either. Pass far side. Good defense there. Braden Mahalik all over Armbester. The pass incomplete, and it'll bring up a second down. Mahalik, the senior from St. Clairsville, Ohio. 5'9", 175 pounds, brings up second down and 15. Yeah, Armbrester was a primary receiver, too, for Carnegie Mellon last year. You see here he's been targeted a few times by quarterback Ben Mills. Second down, 15, 9, 13 left first quarter, no score. Waynesburg and Carnegie Mellon. Mills goes shotgun. And off goes to Bicklidge. Past midfield up over to the 45. To the 40-yard line. Richard Kraus, department chair, stopping by the booth to say hello. Do you like how I moved us inside because it's too cold upstairs? Yep. 
Brings up a third down inside nine minutes to go. Ball spotted at the Waynesburg 40-40 yard line, third and six. Shotgun formation for the Tartans. Back goes Mills. Throwing it long down the field, and it's into and out of the hands and out of the reach of the receiver, Chris Hughes. Good defense by the Jackets. Fourth down, Tartans. Yeah, I saw Brayden Mahalik, too, coming in on a blintz uh, off the left side of the line, and he did well applying pressure to Ben Mills, which very well may have forced that pass, and the pass went incomplete, so good job all around by the defense on that play. It's fourth down and six. Carnegie Mellon will punt. Howard Metzger Jr. back deep for Waynesburg. And the punter is Casey Jeb, the sophomore. Takes the snap, boots it away, and this is end over end big time. Bounces at the 20, inside the 10, and a favorable tartan bounce to the five yard line. And that is where CMU will down it. Unlike drive number one for the Jackets, starting at their own 35. CMU pins them deep. Waynesburg, the long field challenge for its second offensive possession of the game. And it looks like Chris Smithley and company will stick with Tyler Raines at quarterback. Schlenker, a lot of experience on this team as the starter. Two for seven of 11 yards last week. Raines, 13 of 28, had the interception, but... 95 yards, and there's Nick Hall this time for a couple over the middle. So kind of tripped up Hall on there was uh, Noah Castor, one of the linemen. Or excuse me, it was Mason Tolliver, one of the middle linebackers, got him tripped up, and then he fell down and was stopped. Another addition, or rather adjustment, to the Waynesburg University uniforms this season. The last couple of years, they've gone matte black with the helmet. This year, switching to more of a glossy black. Handoff goes back to Nick Hall, and nowhere to go for the Bell Vernon native. Gain of maybe one up to the seven-yard line. Jake Serwin on the tackle for the Carnegie Mellon Tartans, the junior from Gurney, Illinois. It'll bring up a third down and seven, seven and a half to go first quarter, scoreless ball game. Waynesburg off to a better start pacing-wise, I guess you could say, than last week against W&J. Oh, for sure. Again, the final score on that one, 66 nothing. W W&J coming down here and owning the field of play for 60 minutes. Reigns under pressure. He's going to be sacked. Is it a safety? It is not. They're going to mark him down at the... Or do they rule a safety? We'll watch the replay one more time. I believe they're going to mark him at the inch line. Yeah, you're going to watch Sam Broad, number eight. He's the one on the right there, the first one to get to range. Oh, he just got out. They gave him forward progress. I do believe. Nope, they do. They're going to rule it a safety. They rule it late. So Carnegie Mellon awarded two points. Tyler Reigns, I thought it looked more so like a safety than anything. I would have actually been kind of shocked if they stride away from that safety call. So CMU gets two points. Waynesburg will punt it away. We'll keep it here on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. So again, the safety gives Carnegie Mellon two points, and it will also give them the ball, a free kick coming from likely Caden Roberts, the punter of the Jackets. One more time, you see the sack. Good edge rushing from Carnegie Mellon. Again, you got to give credit to uh, Ben Coyne coming off of that edge as well as uh, Skylar Blacker out of the middle. That was something that W&J did a lot of last week as well was able to penetrate that Waynesburg offensive line and give the quarterback some trouble. Yeah, I mean, if you can do that, if the if the first line up can get to the quarterback, then the rest of the defense is fine because – there's nowhere to go. Yeah, there's nowhere, he had to, nowhere go. to go there. He just pulled back and had to had to take the sack, but unfortunately it was in the space where it was in the end zone, which gave up two points. So Carnegie Mellon gets the ball back. Instead of electing to punt, it'll be Jared Witwicky kicking it away from the 20 yard line. He angles it near the sideline, taking it at the 43 yard line of Carnegie Mellon is an up man, and that up man for the Tartans is Sean, check that, Noah Castor, the defensive end, a junior from Ewing, New Jersey. 
Number 47 gives Carnegie Mellon good field position, and you hope uh, for the Jackets' sake that that safety isn't a momentum killer because Carnegie Mellon and Waynesburg pretty much even tilt the, uh, throughout the start of this game, and then a safety happens, and now Carnegie Mellon up two gets the ball back and has prime field position to start its next drive. Yeah, well, Waynesburg started out on their first drive running the ball well. It just didn't turn out that way the second time, and Carnegie Mellon could afford to apply excess pressure because they were close to the end zone. And they got the safety. So it's Ben Mills handing it off here to Bicklage. Bicklage inside the 35, inside the 30. Nope, right at the 30-yard line as goes Luke Bicklage, the senior from Greer, South Carolina. Looked like Connor Hudson made the stop. Connor Hudson listed as the backup free safety to good friend department all-star Jesse Kane, the sophomore Six foot, two hundred pound safety out of Hedgesville, West Virginia, but no sign of Jesse Kane on the field this evening. So in goes Connor Hudson, the senior from Forest Hills, Pennsylvania. Again to the Waynesburg 30. Bicklage gets it back, and this time the Jackets are all over him. A fantastic job by that Jackets front seven and wrapping it up. And you see exchanging some words is Brett Hicks, the junior from Chartiers Valley. A standout on this defense basically since his uh, career started as a member of the Jackets. Also a good job there. Alec Handel, the weak side backer in on the play as well. The freshman from Cannon McMillan. Well, speaking of Jesse Kane as well, just go back to that. Jesse Kane is not dressed on the sideline for Waynesburg. He's wearing a hoodie under his jersey and sweatpants. Last second change to the lineup. Kane listed as the starting free safety on the two deep released by the team this week. So hopefully everything is all right with social media director of the of the WCTV. And as I say that, Caleb Stevens takes down Ben Mill. Stevens, the senior from New Brighton, gives Carnegie Mellon a third and long. And watch as the senior Stevens penetrates that line right past the right guard, Zach Zaransky, listed as the backup center in over Sean Pagorals, the right guard, who wasn't in on that play, and that might have had something to do with it. Credit to Stevens to get the sack. Looked like there was pressure coming on the outside, too, which forced Mills up the inside where Stevens was to make the tackle. Five minutes left first quarter. Carnegie Mellon a safety up two. Third down, Andy Levin rolling right and wide open. Mills completes it to his receiver. Mike Uribe, and it's a first and goal upcoming for the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. Uribe was wide open as Ben Mills rolled right. Yeah, go watch this again. Had space to roll out, and then you see him just found the open man. Had a little extra time to roll out and throw a strong pass. Uribe, the junior from Canyon County, California, his first reception of the season Puts Carnegie Mellon at the two-yard line. Mills, handoff, Bicklage, touchdown. Carnegie Mellon scores its first touchdown of the game and the first touchdown of the game for either team. The senior Bicklage tacks on his third touchdown of the season. Carnegie Mellon up eight, looking to make it nine with the extra point. Well, this is a simple inside handoff. Broke one tackle, made a move, and had space up the middle to push through and score. The holder is Jack Koshko, the long snapper Kevin O'Brien, the kicker Hayden Hairston, and it all works. Carnegie Mellon 9, Waynesburg nothing. 4-11 left first quarter. The Tartans come out hot. Stay hot, up 9 nothing on the Jackets. It's Jacket Ball when we come back. Waynesburg University football right here on Woosin. Stay with us. We're going to fade up to uh, camera 3 and 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, take it.
Welcome back to the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Jack Hilgrove alongside Nicholas Callis. Carnegie Mellon 9, Waynesburg nothing. The Carnegie Mellon touchdown from Luke Bicklage, the running back, his third of the season. A safety earlier in the ballgame on Waynesburg's last offensive possession gives Carnegie Mellon 9 points, and they're getting ready to kick it back off to the Jackets. That's Hayden Harrison running up on the ball. Swings the right leg through it, and it's high, and it'll hit right inside the 10-yard line. It's going to be taken by Howie Metzger at the 20, 25, 30. And Metzger passed, no, not to the 30, passed the 25-yard line at the 26, and that's where the offense for Waynesburg will go to work. Now, we were told that Tyler Raines was the starter. He was the starter for the first two offensive possessions, and it looks like... Tyler Raines will stay out as the quarterback for the Jackets. There he is, number 18. Jack Hillgrove, Nicholas Callis upstairs, our spotter and statistician Andrew Rhea, producer Riley Holsinger, director Matt Mansfield, and the rest of our Woosen crew. Here at a cold John F. Wiley Stadium on a Thursday night, there goes Justin Flack, the carry, past the 30 up to the 31-yard line for a gain of five, slapping the ball in frustration. I feel like a cut maybe a split second sooner would have freed him up from that tripping defender and we'll uh, we'll watch it real quick let's see how close he was to breaking one here almost got to give credit to the linebacker on the play OB Nato junior from Morristown New Jersey and there goes Flack again up to the 34 yard line for a gain of 3 on second and 5 and it'll bring up a third down and 2 well, don't forget, too, it was 30 degrees at the start of the game, and the temperature will not rise as the sun continues to set. So this is more of a fall, uh, more of fall weather in a, in a spring setting. Third and three. Screen pass. Near side, Brennan is swarmed by the Tartans. Orion Ari Hedge. And it looked like the backup weak side safety, Jack Koshko, all over. Sean Brennan, the sophomore receiver from Moon Township. No gain, brings up fourth and three. Last week, Sean Brennan, three receptions for 30 yards. It was the first time the Moon Township native made any catches in his collegiate career. His fourth one today is for no gain. Two and a half minutes left, first quarter. Uh, Kate and Caden Robert. Roberts will punt it away. And it's a fake. Roberts acts as if the snap goes over his head, and I don't think the Jackets come anywhere close to the first down marker. They don't. The fake does not prevail. Last week, Chris Smithley electing to go with a fake punt with Caden Roberts throwing the football as the punter, and it didn't work. He threw an interception, and this time, Smithley goes for the fake. It comes up empty-handed once again. Carnegie Mellon already up nine points with some prime field position once more. Yeah, it was Matt Craig with the ball. He just didn't have any space to run. It was uh, the front collapsed and was able to stop that, and now Carnegie Mellon back on offense. Matt Craig, as you mentioned, the junior receiver from Avella. So Carnegie Mellon... Mills on the read option keeps it inside the 30 to the 29-yard line. Did you say Jay has the replay? Uh, okay. Yeah, so for uh, for Waynesburg just struggling now. Uh, and for Carnegie Mellon, they might have an advantage here on a cold day. Not having to use their starting quarterback, J.D. Dayhoff, might be a, an advantage for the rest of the season. They can let the freshman continue to work and score for them. If he keeps up his success, that's Ben Mills. Yeah, 6'2", 205 from the Woodlands, Texas. Dayhoff, 6'1", 180 pounds from Westerville, Ohio. Last week, 8 of 19, 139 yards, one interception, no touchdowns. All three, or uh, rather all, uh, both of Carnegie Mellon's touchdowns from Bickledge on the ground. There's Mills again. He's going to fire it up. The go route is just out of the reach of the receiver armbrester. As the ball was out of his break. And just too long, he beat the defensive, uh, or the corner on that side, Vinny San Martino. That uh, that play just a little too long. There you see Armbester, the junior from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Two catches, 32 yards last week. One catch for nine yards, the other for 23. That was his long. Third down and five. 
Coming into the game, Carnegie Mellon last week one of nine on third downs, 0 for 2 on fourth downs. Mills the snap, big rush, throws across the middle pass, caught inside the 20 down to the 15 yard line, that's Uribe. He just knows how to get open apparently. Was <laughs> wide open on the third down, the last possession that took it to the two yard line. He's wide open on the third and five that puts Carnegie Mellon at first down and 10. Yeah, take a look here, Armbruster's had plenty of time. The offensive line doing well for Carnegie Mellon. And never mind, we won't see it. Yeah, you saw that pocket though for Mills to sit in. You saw the still shot of the pocket. He had all kinds of time to throw it and stay poised. And that's key for a freshman quarterback. Give him some time, keep him relaxed. Pistol formation for Mills. Hand off to Bicklidge. Shake and bake inside the 15 down to the 14-yard line. A gain of two. Just inside a minute here in quarter number one. About 40 seconds remaining. Well, this was the game plan for Carnegie Mellon last week. They used Luke Bicklidge a lot, the running game. He... Ran for 58 yards on 16 attempts, and he scored both of their touchdowns last week against Grove City. So the passing game wasn't too huge for Carnegie Mellon against Grove City, but it's been Bicklidge, the one who's continued to get carries, and the one that scored. And he scored in this game, too. Lucas Donnelly, the sophomore from St. Clairsville, on the tackle. 15 seconds. Mills to the end zone. What a catch! Touchdown! Carnegie Mellon! Chris Hughes! Over the top with seven seconds to spare in quarter number one. And Carnegie Mellon out to a three-score lead. Yeah, that's something tough to defend. Chris Hughes with good agility to get up, keep his toes in bounds, come down with the football. Only a two-score lead, I apologize. Still could stay a two-score lead with this extra point. Ball snap, kick up, and it is good. 16 to nothing, the Carnegie Mellon Tartans are on top. Eight seconds left first quarter. We'll take a break. We'll come back in a moment and wrap up quarter number one. It's Waynesburg University football on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. It's a Saturday night. You know what that means. Time to party. Sam is having a good time watching sports, drinking beer, playing Pong, not a care in the world for Sam. Nobody at the party stops Sam. They let him walk out the door with his keys, even though he was stumbling, having a hard time to stand up. What happened less than 10 minutes later would change Sam's life forever. Waynesburg University football on the Waynesburg University Sports Network is brought to you by the Waynesburg University Department of Communication. Faculty Advisor Melinda roder Skurbin, Department Chair Richard Krause, Faculty Advisor of a bunch of us here, Lady for Terry, former voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates, stopping down earlier this evening during the setup. There's the kickoff, and Metzger will bring it near side, 15, and he is clobbered. On the play, hit hard is Howie Metzger, the senior from Connellsville. And laying the boom for Carnegie Mellon was Tommy Corey, this freshman safety. And that will bring, oh, no, 3.1 seconds left. So Waynesburg will run one more play in this first quarter before the second quarter, or rather the first quarter ends and the second quarter begins. And while we wait an up... Uh an update on the other game going on today in the President's Athletic Conference. Washington and Jefferson College leads Geneva College with 14-19 uh, left in the second quarter. So these games relatively around the same point. Yeah, 6 nothing the score in that one. For those of you keeping score at home, W&J outscoring opponents 72 nothing to start this short spring 2020 season. There's a run off the left side for a gain of a about one second down and nine first quarter over we're going to take a break and we'll come back and bring you the second quarter momentarily on the waynesburg university sports network we'll see you in a sec have you ever been to the everly library if not you should because it's great they have books of all different genres history biography fiction try the evolution of life life of pi or jurassic park so what if books aren't your thing Try movies, like Frozen, or TV shows, like Lost. Books and DVDs aren't the only thing, though. 
take a trip to the second floor. Welcome to the Writing Center. These tutors will tell you everything you need to know about writing a paper, and they'll help revise your essays. Now let's head back down. Behold, the Knox Learning Center. Need to print something out five minutes before your next class because you procrastinated? No problem. You can also print off pictures of dogs. Because, well, you can. So grab your homework, laptop, and textbook, and study diligently. Bring your lunch, too. Actually, you can't. That's illegal. There's a pass down the near side. Tipped and picked off. With it for Carnegie Mellon is Erwin Hedge. Hedge inside the 20 to the 15. And a flag flies at the end of the game. The ball tipped originally by Kevin Arcia. And then into the hands of Aryan Hedge, the sophomore strong safety. Won't come back to the second quarter of play. Waynesburg turns it over on the first play of the quarter. I mean, it wasn't an awful pass. Uh, I, I guess the only thing that was wrong with that was that he that uh, Reigns threw it into double coverage. And uh, you saw Arcia tip it. And then the interception by the other defender. So, uh... so a personal foul penalty against the Jackets will bring Carnegie Mellon closer half the distance. They returned it to the 18. They'll get it now at the 9-yard line. First down and goal for CMU. Ben Mills... It was listed as the backup. Comes in and says, you know what, I'm going to take first team reps and give my team out to a 16-0 lead with 14.48 left second quarter. In the pistol, Mills hands it off to Bicklidge, and Bicklidge gains maybe a yard. I'll call it a half of a yard. Good job by the Waynesburg defense up front. Lucas Donnelly on the trip-saving tackle as well as Caleb Stevens. On just an update on Luke Bicklidge, the Carnegie Mellon University running back. In the first half, seven carries for 28 yards total. Second down, nine for Carnegie Mellon. Bicklidge to the left of Mills in the shotgun. Man goes in motion, snap, Bicklidge, handoff. And he's bottled up right away. Alec Handel off of the edge. Also, Braden Mahalik on the corner fire. The two jackets to the ball carrier. No gain. Third down and nine. And despite the score, Nick, Waynesburg's given you know Carnegie Mellon a couple of difficult third down opportunities. But a guy by the name of Michael Uribe just is wide open on all of them. But the defense is putting themselves in pretty good positions in, in providing third down, favorable third downs. Snap. Mills. End zone. Too easy for the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. Touchdown. No, do they call that incomplete? They do. The judge, the side judge on the far side, Matt Ridgeway, says no. He bobbled it. And Chris Hughes respectfully disagrees. Hey. We might be able to give you a good look, but it's Division Three football. There's not going to be a replay review. Fourth down and eight, and Carnegie Mellon's going to kick a field goal. Yeah, quite unfortunate. Chris Hughes had another catch in the corner earlier in the game for a CMU touchdown, and now some celebration going on. Or So the officials converge. They say... Hughes did not bobble the ball and instead scores a touchdown for Carnegie Mellon. Well, I've announced Division Three football for pretty much the entirety of my time at Waynesburg University, and I've never seen a call get overturned like that without any replay, but here we are. 23-0 after the extra point is good. Carnegie Mellon out to a commanding lead here in the second quarter. Well, to talk about the officials convening, too, um, I've umpired before, and I kind of understand that uh, as an as an umpire or any type of official, you want to get the call right. So even though it's not frequently seen, 
a good crew will get together, discuss it, see what other eyes are on the play, and then if they understand that there was a mistake made, then they'll overturn the call because the main job of an official is to get the call right, not necessarily to uphold every call because they're humans. Everybody makes mistakes. Absolutely. 13-18 left second quarter on the season. For those of you keeping score at home, the Jackets outscored through just over five quarters of play in football this season, 89 to nothing. Losing last time out to W&J, 66 zip, down 23 zip to Carnegie Mellon here. But the Jackets get the ball back here after the Carnegie Mellon touchdown. Speaking of Washington and Jefferson, Geneva's doing a better job with W&J. Just over 10 minutes left in the second quarter, and it's still a 6 nothing game. 13-18 left second quarter. It'll be Hairston to kick off. Metzger and Moeller back to receive for the Jackets of Waynesburg. Hairston's boot is a low line drive that'll hit at the 10 yard line and this time it's Moeller to the 20, 25. Up near the 30-yard line, and he'll be brought down at the 29-yard line by a swarm of Tartan footballers, and that's where the Jackets' offense will take over. And they're still going with Tyler Raines, the quarterback. No Mason Schranker yet, so Tyler Raines continued to be trusted, continues to be trusted as the quarterback of Waynesburg. Yeah, Nick Hall, the running back to the right of Raines. Pass near side, intercepted. Two consecutive interceptions for the Jackets. This time it's Sean Knight, the junior weak side corner from New Canyon, California. And two plays, two turnovers for the Jackets. Carnegie Mellon gets it back with prime field position. Waynesburg's 41 yard line. Well, I'm not sure if that was their designed receiver option on that play. But that's again where Tyler Raines threw it into double coverage and it got intercepted. His first interception that he threw on the last offensive drive for Waynesburg was a pass into double coverage. So nothing different there and the same result. Turnover and Carnegie Mellon goes back to offense. I think double coverage might have been a little bit of an understatement. There were a couple of other guys in the area. It looked like the Waynesburg receiver had a blanket around him. A couple of blankets around him. Here's Mills trying in it deep. Armbester touchdown. Are you kidding me? Welcome to Division Three football. Ben Mills throwing an absolute dime to Ben Armbrester, beating the Waynesburg corner, Brandon Mahalik, on the near side. One play, one score, 29 0 Carnegie Mellon up top. Well, the largest deficit that Waynesburg lost by to Carnegie Mellon was the 2019 game where they lost 24-3, so a 21-point deficit. Other than that, it stayed within a 15-point game over their their last three other games, and Waynesburg won two seasons ago, but here, just uh, they're struggling right now. If Waynesburg doesn't score at all, this will be the largest deficit uh, in the last five seasons that CMU and Waynesburg have played uh, each other in. The extra point up and good. Carnegie Mellon 30, Waynesburg nothing. 12.58 left second quarter. One play, one score. Mills to Armbruster on an absolute beauty. Deep ball down the near side. Carnegie Mellon losing last week, only scoring 14 points against Grove City, but they're out to a little bit more of a commanding lead and a little more poise offensively that gives them 30 points only three minutes into the second quarter. Part of the problem, too, for Waynesburg on that play was Braden Mahalik, the one who got overpassed. Uh, but Mahalik seemed to look up for the ball a bit too early, and then Armbrester seemed to sneak behind him toward the end zone, then got past him and had the open space to catch that pass. So again, Harrison will kick it off. We shall see if Chris Smithley sticks with Tyler Raines, but if I had to take an educated guess, I would expect to see Mason Schranker come out as the quarterback after two consecutive interceptions from Raines. I don't know how. It depends. Uh, it depends if those plays were planned. Like if they had one receiver they yeah. were looking for, then it's not Raines' fault. But if Raines is actively throwing 
into multiple covered receivers, that's that's a that's a quarterback problem. One more time for Moeller, past the 20 up to the 23 yard line. It's where he's tackled by Carnegie Mellon and Waynesburg will come out again offensively. We shall see. Is it Reigns? Is it Schranker? Reigns, the Rains. junior transfer from Towson. Schranker, the senior from Montour. And it still Reigns out there. First and ten. Reigns will keep it himself on the handoff, and he'll be tackled just short of the 25. Second down. So Tyler Reigns again staying into the ball game for Waynesburg. Justin Flack, there you see him. Didn't play at all last week, number 30. For Waynesburg, and coincidentally enough, those two guys roommates. Here's Reigns again with an open. Sean Brennan past the 30-yard line. The pass is caught. Past the 30 up to the 31, and Waynesburg able to gain some yardage there. Again, down 30. There you see Brennan, the sophomore from Moon Township. Third down two for the Jackets. Reigns in the gun. Pass near side, Metzger bobbled, caught it, trudges forward, or tries to at least, but it's going to be well short of the marker. He got maybe a yard. Third and two makes it third and one, or rather fourth and one. That was Nick Sizek there who wrapped up Metzger and brought him down. Watch it here. Yeah, there you see Metzger tried to dig his head forward. Only at 5'5", five, five, but he's got a lot of power underneath those legs, but all that power doesn't help when you got four defenders in the vicinity ready to take you down. Fourth down and two. Down 30, why not go for it on your own 31-yard line? Whistle and a timeout, I believe. Carnegie Mellon, Rich Lackner wants to talk things over. They do call their first timeout of the half, each team with two timeouts remaining. It's the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Check us out on YouTube, WUDP. Thank you for joining us. You can check out all kinds of shows that we create at WCTV about politics, news, sports, entertainment, and a heck of a lot of good content on WUDP. Thank you for joining us. If you have any suggestions, comments, concerns, you can reach out to our faculty advisor, Melinda Roeder, at mroeder. M-R-O-E-D-E-R at waynesburg.edu or our department chair Richard Kraus R-K-R-A-U-S-E at waynesburg.edu to very supportive people of the Waynesburg University Sports Network Professor Kraus dropping a lot of things uh, at the drop of a hat and getting things done for us to be able to broadcast sports this spring Nothing going on in the fall. There's the handoff to Flack, who I believe is able to pick up the first down. Well, some ZMU players were pointing the other way. And now there's standstill on the field. Oh, that helps. Offside, CMU. Oh, yep, that helps a lot. Flack was just about a half yard short on the run, but an offside penalty against the Tartans gives Waynesburg a new set of downs, and it's about time these Jackets caught a break. Oh, that's their... <laughs> Waynesburg was one for six last week on fourth downs against Washington and Jefferson, and that's the second first down conversion they've had this game. Across the middle, pass is batted away. A good job there, Nick Sizek. The safety across the middle. Had a beat, did the receiver, Sean Brennan, on the defender. But a diving effort from Sizek to be able to bat it away brings up second and ten for the Jackets. Here you see it one more time. Oh, he didn't even bat it away. Brennan just didn't catch the football. Looked like from up here that Sizek got might have got a hand on it, but and there you see another one. And this time, 
the Jackets make up for it. Pass complete across midfield. And Brennan said, I dropped the last one. I'll catch this one. First down, Jackets. Short memory for the sophomore from Moon Township. We'll take a look at the replay soon as Waynesburg gets set back up on offense. Actually, we might not be able to cut to a replay. Chris Smithley says, let's put the tempo. We'll cut it quick. Well, there it is. Good catch. Good contact as well. Hedge get, uh, laid the boom. But Brennan was able to hold on to it. And as I say that, Flack takes the carry past midfield up to the 47, rather down to the 47-yard line. Gain of about two. Inside 10 minutes remaining second quarter. Flack and Reigns in the backfield. Metzger, Brennan, and Tavarich. Sean Brennan and Brendan Tavarich to the far side of the field. Reigns will roll it that way. Pass is slow but incomplete. Looking for Tavarich. Just a tad low, and it'll bring up a third down and long for the Jackets. Third down and eight. Yeah, well defended out there by, whoop, replay coming up. So we'll see who the defender was. Ooh, a bit of contact before the ball came down, but nothing too severe. A good job there from Sean Knight, the weak side corner on Tavarich. Third down eight. Handoff up the middle to Justin Flack. He'll gain maybe a yard. Justin Flack no, right no, now. No gain on third down and eight. A run inside. Brings up fourth down, and it looks like Chris Smithley will keep the offense on the field. Flack with now seven carries and 17 yards. Not being as effective today. Nick Hall coming into the football game now. He will stand to the right of Reigns in the shotgun. Two receivers bunched either way. Reigns back to pass on fourth down. Big rush throws, and the pass is caught. No, incomplete. A good job there from the Carnegie Mellon defender on Sean Brennan, who had a beat on it but wasn't able to come up with it. Good job there. You see him on your screen. Nick Sizek, the weak side safety. We'll watch the replay. Definitely not a bad pass. Slowing it up here, it was in his hands and out of his hands. Yeah, there it was. Right at the end of the play, Brennan had it and then fell, uh, or rather it fell out of his hands, and I think Nick Sizek had a little bit to do with that. These Carnegie Mellon members of the secondary are all over the jacket receivers. So a turnover on downs. Mills hands off to Bicklidge, and Bicklidge will run it far side, tries to get out of bounds. Gets up to the 49-and-a-half-ish yard line for a gain of about three. And they're going to mark him down right at the 49 for a gain of two. Prior to that last run, Luke Bicklidge, nine attempts, 29 yards gained so far this game. Again, minus that last run. Se second down and eight for Carnegie Mellon. Mills back to pass with all the time in the world. Airs it deep. Has a man and the pass is short. Hughes was open. The pass was just a tad short and off of the mark. Chris Hughes, the junior from Springboro, Ohio, has a touchdown already this game. Two touchdowns, I should say. Last week, three catches for 77 yards along of 59. And it brings up another third down and long for the Tartans. It seems like CMU right now is using Michael Uribe for short outside passes, and then Chris Hughes is the receiver getting downfield, creating open space uh, for the longer passes for a gain of uh, bigger yardage. Yeah, last season, Armbrester, who's listed as wide receiver number one this season for Carnegie Mellon, as Mills steps up, runs, and puts the hammer down, and... Trudges forward for a first down, I do believe. It looked like he was pretty close. But as I was saying, Alec Oshita was the leading receiver last year for Carnegie Mellon, and Chris Haas the leading rusher. So insert Luke Bicklidge and Ben Armbester into those roles, and they've done a pretty 
decent job at it as well. As you can add Chris Hughes to that conversation as well. And on third down and eight, here's Ben Mills with the conversion. So he just runs through the line. Then notices he has open space. Looked like he tried to pass it, or looked to pass it, even though he crossed the line of scrimmage. But, I mean, that's a good run there. Again, of about 10 and a new set of downs. Monroe Moeller on the here. tackle for Waynesburg. 7-14 remaining second quarter. Flag on the play as the run comes up for Carnegie Mellon. So an offsides call on CMU. No, on Waynesburg. Oh, on Waynesburg, I'm sorry. CMU benefits. Yes, they do. Five yards. There you see as the flags fly as Sean Hitler heads into the backfield to make the play just a tad too early. Man in motion for Carnegie Mellon. That's Spencer Turling, the H-back. Play action. Mills out to the flat. Pass caught by Turling inside the 30-yard line. Down to the 29. Spencer Turling, the senior from Washington, Pennsylvania. The six foot two, or rather the 5'11", 205-pound senior. Brandon Tanko on the tackle. The sophomore middle linebacker from Hyattsville, Maryland. And there you see the Conversion for Carnegie Mellon. All done on the fake. Huh. Yeah, fooling our camera operator on that side, Brock Owens. I guess that's how you know. It's a good fake. It's a good fake. And you see that. Oh, there's a fumbled snap. Mills picks it up. Almost tackling him by the shoestrings is in Tanko. So Mills runs it far sideline. He'll end up losing a yard. What a good play by Mills to be able to pick it up. It's a shame that Ntanko couldn't get to him a little quicker. Yeah, but also a good job by the freshman quarterback who's yep. moving around. He's rushed pretty well. He's thrown some good passes. Yeah, just watch this here, the scramble. Just missed him there and then recovers. So instead of a loss of seven, it's a loss of one. Alec Handel made the stop. And in a play like that, if you can only lose one yard, it's almost like it's a gain. Because, you know, the, the turnover percentage on a play like that is higher than keeping the football. Brings up. As a flag flies, a screen pass inside the 15 down to the 13-yard line. But I have a hunch, Nicholas Callis, this is coming back. And I believe it will. It's going to be holding against Carnegie Mellon. I'm not sure that was a screen pass, though. I think Ben Mills just ran it up the middle. He was the one who was the ball carrier. And it is... Yep, holding. It'll back it up to the 31-yard line. Oh, even further back than that. The 41-yard line, I apologize. Makes it first down and 22. Second down. I apologize. Yep, the down just changed on the uh, the scoreboard. Second down, 22. Snap, handoff, Bicklage inside the 40 down to the, about the 36-yard line. Good job there by Jarrett Grove. You'll see the play one more time as Grove was able to make the stop. Now wrapped him up by the legs and waited for some help. Grove, the sophomore, strong safety from Galitzin, Pennsylvania. 5'9", 190 pounds. Mills with time, rolls it right. Rushed by Donley, gets the pass off, and it's tipped. Is it intercepted? No, incomplete. Brandon Tanko had it into his hands. Wasn't able to keep his feet in bounds as he juggled it. And it'll bring up a fourth down for Carnegie Mellon, but a very, very good play by the sophomore linebacker, Tanko. 
And Waynesburg might lose some time instead of the interception. See there, just uh, one Ooh, foot. I don't know. How much did he bobble that football Let's as Jeremiah Miller fat rewinds it for us? Uh, uh, one? No. Oh! Close. Definitely close. We might need to go down there and tell the referees, hey, we can f rewind stuff. Yeah. Give us a replay. I don't know. I mean, the... What do they call it? Inconclusive evidence? I don't know how inconclusive you would call that, but I think it might have been an incom or rather an interception instead of an incomplete pass. Give Tanko all the credit in the world, but again, it'll bring up a fourth down and 18 with 3.51 remaining in quarter number two. Carnegie Mellon up a lot, 30 to nothing. The Jackets outscored by opponents this season, 96 nothing. Falling to W&J last week, 66 zip. Down 30 to zip to Rich Lackner and the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. As we mentioned earlier, Rich Lackner in his 34th season as the head coach at CMU, a Hall of Famer at CMU and in the Western Pennsylvania Athletics Hall of Fame, over 200 career wins, been the head coach at CMU since 1986. And last season led the Tartans to an 8-3 record, a loss in the Scotty Whitelaw Bowl, an ECAC Bowl to Brevard University. Punt gets away on 4th and 18. Fair catch called for by Howard Metzger inside the 10 at the 9-yard line. 3.43 left in the second quarter on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. And the Jackets will take over offensively for the first time in what seems like an eternity for Waynesburg. Well, on offense, they only have two first down conversions. Two drives have ended in interceptions, and the rest were punted away. And it's Tyler Raines, still at quarterback for Waynesburg. No Mason Schreinker yet. Eric McDowell over the football. He's our halftime interview. Pitch comes near side to the running back for the Jackets, Nick Hall. Again, coming up at the half, Adam Morganti sits down with the senior starting center for the Jackets, Eric McDowell. Eric's a fantastic young man. Shady side, Maryland. Loves the game of football. Passionate about the university he attends and the program he plays for. And I got to see a little bit of the interview, and he is fantastic with Adam Morganti. So you're not going to want to miss that. Eric McDowell at halftime on the Waynesburg University Sports Network halftime show. Fake pass. Handoff up the middle. This time it's Justin Flack. And Flack gets to the, well, not back to the line of scrimmage, to the eight-yard line for a loss of one. It brings up a third down and 11 for Waynesburg. Snap reigns. Pass far side, picked off. At the 20 yard line, the third interception of the ball game for the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. I believe that was Sean Knight. It was as he holds the football and hands it to the official. Let's watch it. Third interception thrown by Tyler Raines in this game. I mean, that's another pass that where multiple defenders were covering the receiver. Yep, right in front of Sean Brennan. Trenton Kearns was in the vicinity as well, but that's the third interception for the junior Reigns from Columbia, Maryland. And Carnegie Mellon takes over with 2.26 left second quarter. Pretty much in the red zone at the 21-yard line of Waynesburg. Snap goes to Mills. Handoff goes to Bicklidge. Breaking one tackler inside the 20 down to the 17-yard line for a gain of four. Tanko on the tackle for Waynesburg and... We approach inside two minutes, left in half number one. Well, the CMU scores it all on a field goal or a touchdown. Waynesburg will have had 100 points scored on them before scoring it all. Am I sending it to break and then go into the halftime interview or break us, break halftime? Bicklidge again with nowhere to go. Luke Bicklidge. The senior from Greer, South Carolina. Drew Rio, are your binoculars okay? 
Oh, they're your binoculars. I wanted the strap to get taken off because they kept rubbing against the microphone. Oh, okay. I didn't really notice it, <laughs> but cautious announcer Nicholas Callis wants to make sure our audio is as clear sounding as possible. Absolutely. Potentially the last time we broadcast football on the Waynesburg University Sports Network this season. I know you just got used to us last Friday. Short turnaround, but Waynesburg only scheduled for two home games. There's a pass far sideline looking, I believe, for Armbester near the goal line, but incomplete. Good defense there by the Jackets. Waynesburg is only scheduled for five games this season. Two at home to start the season. One against W&J last week. This one tonight. Next week, Waynesburg takes on uh, Bethany on the road. And then the following week, St. Vincent. And then either the 23rd or the 24th, the PAC crossover game. So how that works is four teams in the North Division, four teams in the South Division. You play everybody once. You play one team in a crossover. St. Vincent's uh, up in the North Division, so they play them already. There's a field goal attempt for Carnegie Mellon. Up and no good. Missing wide right is... The kicker for the Tartans, Hayden Hairston. And Waynesburg will play either on the 23rd or the 24th, the same place finisher in the North Division. So if Waynesburg um, comes in last place in the South, they'll play the fourth place team in the, in the North Division, and they base that game and the location off of where you played the opponent last year. So if St. or rather if they get matched up with Geneva, that game's at home because they played at Geneva last year. If they get matched up with say Grove City, that game was on the road last year, that game would be home this year. So that's how that works. And Waynesburg will take over after the missed field goal with just about a minute remaining in this second half. They got to operate quickly. Reigns pass wide of the mark to Trenton Kearns. Getting a hand on it is the backup strong side outside linebacker, Zachary Van Benicum, the freshman from Valencia, California. Another example of one of these guys from the opposite side of the country coming to CMU to play football. He gets a right paw on it right there. The defense just seems to be everywhere. Ubiquitous on the field. All over the place. Pass near side. This time it's caught by the Jackets. Trenton Kearns missed the last one wide of the mark. Catches this one at the 29-yard line. Jackets go no huddle. Here's the replay. Kearns diving and making the catch. Shotgun look. Reigns back. Pass short of the mark. This time Sean Brennan, I believe, the receiver in the area. It was. You talked about where you use the word ubiquitous as there's a flag on the play, which is an extensive vocabulary word, and i got to give a shameless plug because I'm on a podcast with a couple of guys that graduated from the university and the department as a holding call is charged against Waynesburg University. It's the Come On Network. Shameless plug, follow us at C-O-M-O-N Network. It's myself alumnus or alumni Kyle Dawson, Joe Smeltzer, Donnie Chedrick and I give the shameless plug because you used ubiquitous as a robust vocabulary word yeah. and we had a guy as the pass is incomplete on third down and 11 far side we had a guy on that will be released tomorrow morning that's known for his vocabulary penalty against Waynesburg declined by Carnegie Mellon Doc Emmerich Ooh. We were able to interview the Doc, longtime voice of the NHL on NBC, one of the most prominent play-by-play -play broadcasters of any sport at any level. He joined us on Monday. That episode drops 5.30, or rather 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, wherever you get your podcasts, and he was an absolute treat. So follow us on Twitter, the Come On Network, and give us a listen, give us a subscribe, a stream, a download. We appreciate it. The punt's away from Roberts. It's into the hands of Armbester, who turns it pretty much parallel with the 45-yard line far side, trying to turn it upfield, can't do it. Gets to about the 40. And Luke Mengus on the tackle for Waynesburg as the Jackets take over defensively. Carnegie Mellon offensively with 17 seconds remaining first half. 
The way CMU's played, though, Nick, I don't think it's out of the question that they can't tack on some more points with two timeouts left before the half's said and done. I'm not sure if they would do that, though. They are receiving in the second half. Waynesburg received in the first half. That is so true. Not sure how much risk they'll take getting the ball back anyway. To start Scott, the second half. Scott Venick, the defensive coordinator for Waynesburg, elects to drop everybody back in the event that they do throw it long. Mills tosses it short. Uribe inside the 35 to the 32-yard line. Wackner of Carnegie Mellon, the head coach, calls timeouts. They have one timeout remaining. This is a first down attempt, or rather a first down conversion, I should say. That's what happens when you drop, what, seven, eight guys. And you're not blaming, I'm not blaming Waynesburg for that. They want to protect the end zone in this situation, but it gives up the short side of the field. And with 10 seconds left in quarter number two, Decision time for Carnegie Mellon. They have one timeout. They could try and run one more play and get it closer to, um, I guess, field goal range for Hairston. Hairston's first attempt of the season was last possession for Carnegie Mellon. He missed. Was two for two on point after attempts coming into the ball game, but didn't attempt a field goal last week. Carnegie Mellon scoring two touchdowns, 14 points. I'm just nervous for Waynesburg here again. They haven't scored yet this season. And again, if CMU scores again, that'll be 100 points put on Waynesburg before they score it all this season. So again, the Jackets play prevent. Mills tosses near side pass dropped. Uribe was wide open near side near the 20-yard line. Just nice. forgot the football. We'll see it one more time as... We rewind, and yeah, he was wide open. Would have given Hairston an opportunity for a 37-yard field goal if they call timeout. There you see a play card, Carnegie Mellon, a spade. I noticed that. It wasn't on screen, but I wonder what that's for. Signaling a play, I, if I had to assume, this might be the last one of the path to the end zone. Out of bounds and incomplete. The clock expired after the play went out of bounds, but I doubt they'll add any time to the clock. They do not. That brings us to the end of the second quarter and halftime on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, as I mentioned, Adam Morganti sat down with starting center of the Jackets, Eric McDowell. A very awesome interview and a very awesome kid here at Waynesburg University. Looking forward, um, I'm looking forward for you guys to be able to watch that. But for right now, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, it'll be Adam and Eric for the Waynesburg University Halftime Show. 30 for Carnegie Mellon, a goose egg for Waynesburg. We'll see you in a moment on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Have you ever been to the Everly Library? If not, you should, because it's great. They have books of all different genres. History, biography, fiction. Try the evolution of life, life of pie, or Jurassic Park. So what if books aren't your thing? Try movies, like Frozen, or TV shows, like Lost. Books and DVDs aren't the only thing, though. Take a trip to the second floor. Welcome to the Writing Center. These tutors will tell you everything you need to know about writing a paper, and they'll help revise your essays. Now let's head back down. Behold, the Knox Learning Center. Need to print something out five minutes before your next class because you procrastinated? No problem. You can also print off pictures of dogs. Because, well, you can. So grab your homework, laptop, and textbook and study diligently. Bring your lunch, too. Actually, you can't. That's illegal. Now you know the Everly Library. Stop by any time. Seriously, it's open all week.
to the Waynesburg University Sports Network Halftime Show. I'm Adam Morganti, and joining me for this interview is Eric McDowell. Eric is a senior center on the Waynesburg football team. Eric, thank you for joining me today. The first question I'm, I'm going to ask you, you guys had your fir first game last week against W&J. That was your first game since November 2019, so... What was it like to finally be able to get out there on the field and play football after so much uncertain, uncertainty for this season? Uh, so, I mean, obviously to start, just to get out there again was wonderful. It's an absolute blessing to be able to do what I love doing again, uh, especially seeing COVID, knowing that things can change in a millisecond and that – like the next game is never promised, especially with something going like this. Uh, that's something Coach Smithley always harps on that when we get here, you have 40 games left in your career more than likely. And it, I never really thought I'd see that number. But uh, when obviously things didn't go how we wanted or planned, but it was it was nice to be able to get back on the field and hit someone that wasn't wearing orange and black for the first time, like you said, since November of 2019. So what have the practices been like this season with all the COVID restrictions? So how have they been much different compared to practice in a normal year? Uh, I mean, little things are different. We're able to, you know, do our normal team periods, our inside run, our install, normal things like that, but just like – more things with AT is weird and like the water situation. Practices have been shorter, obviously, as well because of like every every sport going on right now and having three other sports needing the turf when it's normally we only share the turf with men and women's soccer during the fall. But uh, besides just shortened practices, everything else has been fairly similar. Um, Playing on Fridays is also a little bit different for us. So our week, our weeks look a little bit different, but the practices in general are really structured the same and all that fun stuff. Coming into this season, you were the only returning starter from 2019 on the line. So how much of a responsibility do you feel like you have in mentoring the young guys and the other new starters this year on the offensive line? Uh, I think that – that role isn't as big as a lot of people make it out to be. I think that the other guys on the line, they're, they're here for a reason. They know what they're doing there. They're, how can I say it? They're, they're college football players. Um, but at the end of the day, there's little like secrets and not secrets, but like tricks of the trade that you learn over time that it's easy to share with those guys. And I know a lot of guys, especially like, uh, Hunter Coran, who's been playing guard for us a little bit, who, who he, he definitely looks at me and he's, he's been uh, taking some of my guidance, but I don't really think of it like that. I just try to get out there and do my thing. Like, I don't know. That sounds, that doesn't sound how I wanted it to sound, but. And did you feel a little rusty? Um, I guess like since you guys had a long layoff, in your game last week since it took like there was a long time since you hit someone in another jersey so did you feel like you kind of had to ease back into things a little bit or was, was it one of those things where once you got on to the field it was like second nature to you no i definitely felt a lot of rust it it definitely took a little bit to get used to especially like you said not hitting someone for two years or 16 months or whatever it has been um that's something that it, it was more like the preparation, like how, how like my game day looks, getting back into that swing and that routine of things was very different. And I definitely felt a little bit of rust getting out there for the first time in a while. Take me through a typical game day for you. Like, do you have any certain rituals or superstitions that you do for every game day? Uh, so not really. Normally I'm, I'll, be open. I, I don't like playing Friday nights. I know a lot of people love it. it. Reminds them of high school Friday night lights. But I I don't like sitting around all day waiting to play. I like 
like when we play Saturdays because I can wake up, I can go get breakfast, and then I go straight to the locker room. I hang out in the locker room, listen to music, uh, snack a little bit, some peanuts or some peanut butter jelly sandwiches, something before I get down on the field. It, it taped up and all that fun stuff. But I don't really think I have any true pregame rituals or superstitions that I do. I just like a nice routine. All right, fair enough. And with you being a senior, how much growth have you seen in not only your play on the field, but you growing as a person off the field from your freshman year compared to now? Oh, it's been tremendous. My freshman year, I came in here like like most freshmen do, quiet, you know, nervous, a little bit naive to the fact of a lot of things about college football. But uh, through, over the last couple of years, I was fortunate enough to come in and work hard enough to earn a starting spot as a true freshman. Uh, and that has helped me develop into like the leader on the field that I try to be. And even since last year, I'll be the first to tell you, I, I didn't like being a very vo vocal leader. I like to just put my nose to the grindstone and get after it and hope people look at me and are like, oh, I like what that kid's doing. I'm going to do what that kid's doing. But in this off season, or over the past couple 16 months, Coach Smithley has really been challenging me to be that vocal guy and be the guy that these young guys I look up to and ask questions and come to about anything. And so that's, that's really been the most growth I've seen myself as I've come out of a little bit of a shell and been more welcoming to that light and that attention on the field. Joining me on the Waynesburg University Sports Network halftime show is senior football player Eric McDowell. And Eric, when you were a freshman, a sophomore, who were some of those players, the upperclassmen that you looked up to that you felt like you could have gone to to ask any type of question about football? Um, my freshman year, there was a lot of guys, a lot of those guys. Uh, Justin Wilco, who was there my sophomore year as well. Blaze Blarchek. Uh, um, who else? Uh, I'm trying to think freshman year. That was a long time ago, it feels like. Um, my sophomore year, there's a lot of good guys, too. John Glenn Davis, who's now a GA for us. Uh, Garrett Hepner, you know, Alex Polina came out and was a really, really close friend and a, a good mentor for him, I think. Uh, Nick Moretti, love the way that kid grinds. Bobby Grishaber. A lot of, it's a lot of, like, mutual respects for me. Um, yeah, that Will Van Norman on the defensive line, that he's a workhorse. You mentioned how uh, Coach Smithley wants to challenge you to be a vocal leader, but you don't really see yourself as that. So this year as a senior, how hard has it been to try to be the vocal leader of this team? Uh, so at first it was a little bit weird for me because, like I said, I – I played offensive line my entire life. I'm not used to credit, recognition, eyes on me. That's not really something I I was comfortable with. But over the last little bit, I've really, really tried reaching out and stepping up and going out individually because I think that's easier for me if I individually like build a relationship with a kid or with someone, especially like these young freshmen, then it's easier for me to speak up in front of all of them. So if I go out and I, I reach out to seven or 10 freshmen and build that one-on-one -on -one relationship, then those seven to 10 guys know who I am. And I feel comfortable speaking in front of, you know, the new, the 55 new guys or however many there are. Do you feel like you have been able to build some of those one-on-one -on -one relationships with some of the underclassmen this year? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, I think that even because COVID and everything, there's been a lot of limits on like the the film that we can watch, like how many people can be there, the space outs, uh, workouts, and everything. I feel like that this unit is still really, really close. The full team is pretty close. Um, when it comes to just that bond that we have, especially like with the young guys, I feel like a lot of the older guys all deserve credit for 
taking a few young guys under their wings and um, like almost exposing them to the older guys, like bringing them out a little bit out of their shell to form that one-on-one relationship with those guys who I've been forming relationships for the last two, three, four years with, and it's easier to build through that. Awesome. So do you have any specific favorite memories that stand out or any favorite games that you have played in at your te- your tenure here at Waynesburg? Uh, one of my all-time favorite games was my first ever win here at Waynesburg University. It was homecoming my freshman year. It was a nasty, rainy game. Uh, I think we ran the ball for 284 yards, and we had 287 yards of total offense. We scored like 31 points and really just dominated the run game, and that's what I love to do. So that game's obviously one of my favorites. I think another one, like just the electric atmosphere of our sophomore year at, or against Carnegie Mellon at home when Andrew Brinsick had that pick to seal it at the end of the game. Oh, that was, that was a fantastic feeling. Awesome. So with you being a senior and this being your last season, unfortunately it's a shortened season. It's not the normal 10 game season. Do you have any personal or uh, team goals for this season? Uh, well, obviously we wanted to go five and zero and, win the pack, that can't happen anymore after last week. Uh, personally, um, I I mean, I'd, I'd love to make an all-conference nod for the first time ever, but that I don't really care that much about my personal goals. I'd rather go 4-1, you know, win out, uh, and just get ready and prepare for the fall. All right, awesome. Thank you. That was Waynesburg Senior Center. Eric McDowell, thank you for the time on this Waynesburg University Sports Network halftime interview. And coming up next shortly is the second half between Carnegie Mellon and Waynesburg. Don't go any here as you're don't go anywhere as you're watching the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Piracy is a crime. If you see someone downloading copyrighted material without paying for it, then you should inform the authorities immediately. If you download any copyrighted material from the internet without paying for it, then you should go to jail. That was Eric McDowell with Adam Morganti, a, a fantastic interview. Adam always does a fantastic job. And Eric, uh, uh, one of the more prolific players for Waynesburg University and during his time here and a four-year starter over the ball as the center. 30 to nothing, the score at the halftime. Jack Hillgrove alongside Nicholas Callis will give you the second-half coverage of play-by-play. We're going to go over some stats. 30 to nothing. CMU over Waynesburg. 10 first downs for Carnegie Mellon, only three for Waynesburg. Rushing total 17 carries, 49 yards for CMU. Waynesburg 16 carries, 12 yards. Waynesburg only 35 passing yards, 137 for Carnegie Mellon on 8 of 16. Waynesburg 6 of 15, 3 interceptions. 
Total plays, 33 for Carnegie Mellon, 31 for Waynesburg, 186 yards for CMU, only 47 for Waynesburg. Three turnovers for the Jackets, three interceptions by Tyler Rain, 6 of 15 for 35 yards. He's a quarterback for the Jackets. The quarterback for Carnegie Mellon is Ben Mills. 8 of 16, 137 yards, three touchdowns, a long completion of 41. Mike Uribe, the leading receiver for Carnegie Mellon, three receptions, 52 yards. Ben Armbrester, 55 yards, one touchdown, two receptions. And Chris Hughes, two catches, two touchdowns, 22 yards. Spencer Turling has a catch for eight yards as well. For the Jackets, receiving-wise, Sean Brennan, three catches, 22 yards. Trenton Kearns, two catches for 13 yards. Howie Metzger, one catch, no gain. And the rushing totals, it's uh, three different ball carriers, uh, or rather four, I should say, for Waynesburg. Three carries, negative 10 yards. Those are the sacks for Tyler Raines. Justin Flack, the leading rusher, eight carries, 17 yards. Nick Hall, four carries, five yards. Matt Craig on that fake punt, no gain on the carry there. And only two rushers for Carnegie Mellon, 13 carries, 38 yards for Luke Buchledge. Ben Mills, four carries, 11 yards. Your impression on this first half, Nicholas Callis? I think Ben Mills did really well uh, being the freshman quarterback. The numbers he put up again, eight for 16. He threw for 137 yards and three touchdowns. Um, you know, he's done really well, and I think Waynesburg has just struggled, especially Tyler Raines throwing into heavy coverage, um, which has been problematic for him. We'll see if Mason Schrenker makes an appearance, but uh, the offense, I mean, everything just has to get better. Tyler Raines needs to have more time to throw the ball, not throw into coverage, and uh, the defense just has to try to stop Luke Bickledge on the run and try to contain the quarterback for CMU, Ben Mills. The snow flies on April Fool's Day. One more break. We'll come back. Nick Callis will take you home on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Piracy is a crime. If you see someone downloading copyrighted material without paying for it, then you should inform the authorities immediately. If you download any copyrighted material from the internet without paying for it, then you should go to jail. You're watching the Waynesburg University Sports Network. I'm Nicholas Callis, Jack Kilgrove with me. Also up in the booth here, Andrew Rhea running statistics and doing spotting for us. We always appreciate that help. It's 30 degrees right now in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. The sun completely set. And the temperature not expected to increase with the sun being down and nighttime upon us. Waynesburg losing this game 30-0. to zero. The second half about to begin. CMU kicked in the first half, so they will receive here in the second half. And their deep receivers are on the 20-yard line, not expecting a high kick, especially, or a long kick, especially with the temperatures right now. And that kick will get past the 20, as a matter of fact, received, and then... Brought back 25-30 and the stop there by Waynesburg just past the 30-yard line. If you're the Jackets here, I, I think you want to try and, you know, obviously it's it's not good to start the season. You're six quarters through your, your season already and being outscored 96 nothing and through the first game and a half. I, I think they could bounce back nicely here with a turnover. Uh, if they can get CMU to maybe fumble or uh, cause an interception or two here, uh, I, I think that would bounce Waynesburg back in the right direction as well. I also wanted to very quickly before this first play, so I was mentioning that Jeremiah Miller, our replay operator, was fast forwarding. And I guess the way that I might have stumbled my words, it sounded like I called him fat. Jeremiah, I'm very, very sorry. I didn't. That was not my intention. You're doing a fantastic job. Ben Armbrester got the ball on that last play and uh, right away a first down achieved by CMU. It was an option to Luke Bickledge and then Ben Armbrester carried the football. And a first down for Waynesburg, first and 10 from CMU's 45. They're right around midfield. Yeah, Carnegie Mellon. The halftime break and the colder weather didn't seem to halt their offense. One play, one first down to start this half. Uh -oh. Mills hands off to Bickledge, and he is 
He has all the space in the world inside the 10, the 5, and a touchdown. CMU scores two plays into the second half. A, a bit longer than a 50-yard run there for Luke Bicklage, the running back of Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah, that's uh, that's as good as it gets for Carnegie Mellon to start this the second half, right? I mean, one play, one first down, a completion, and then uh, an inside zone handoff off of the right side to Bicklage, untouched. I mean, there was not even a defender in the vicinity of Luke Bicklage. A tremendous play call from the sidelines for Carnegie Mellon, and it puts them up 37 to nothing. Jack Costcho was the holder there and the kicker, Hayden Harrison. So now it's 37 to nothing. Waynesburg trailing CMU. And now Waynesburg this season to start the year. They have been outscored by opponents 104 to 0. Good math. And they've reached the century mark, giving up points before they've scored any. Waynesburg has not scored at all this season, gave up 66 points to W and J without scoring at all. And now they're down 37 and a significant amount of time left in this game. We've just started the second half here at John F. Wiley Stadium. And while we wait for this kickoff to get underway, a scoring update on the other game going on in the President's Athletic Conference today. Two other teams playing. It's Geneva and Washington and Jefferson. A close game. Washington and Jefferson leading 13-6 with about 7 minutes 50 seconds left in the third quarter of that game. And not not to pick at your math, bud, but you were a point off, 103. Was I? Yeah. Oh. Because six and seven is 13. Carry the one. Six and seven is 13. And you drop the three. Carry the one. You know what I'm saying? Like 66 plus 37 is 103. Drat. It Thank happens. you for correcting me. <laughs> a squib kick coming toward the 15, and it's picked up and fielded. Waynesburg will return. We're the far side, and Carrier brought down around the 30. It was Howard, oh, Howie Metzger. Late hit. Two flags fly at the same time. This is going to be a personal foul. Looked like somebody landed on the back of Howard Metzger. So they'll convene. So oh, Waynesburg against, called. Yeah with the unnecessary roughness penalty, which will push them back even further. Yeah. And, and and I, no, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say a lot of what Waynesburg has struggled with thus far is field position. Um, you know, the, the numbers speak for itself, uh, giving up 103 points thus far this season without scoring. But it doesn't help that they're given 85, 90, and 95-yard drives, potential drives, to start. Tyler Raines hands off to Nick Hall, and Hall brought down in the backfield. At least no gain on the play, and it's second down. Yeah, good job there by, and as we see some uh, other players get involved for Carnegie Mellon defensively, Noah Castor from Ewing, New Jersey, junior defensive end, strong side defensive end, 6'3", 215, good frame, good build, able to make the stop. Same personnel for Waynesburg, Nick Hall still in the backfield, but Reigns likes to pass, throws, and the pass caught out there by Trenton Kearns. And he is stopped by the defender for CMU, Jack Koscho. Yep, right there, right over top of him. And it was, you know, an out route from Kearns, ran it well and was able to catch it. But, uh, again, Carnegie Mellon's defense not giving any room. There has been a blanket, a very, very comfortable and hefty Afghan around every Waynesburg receiver this evening. Nick Halston in the backfield, Reigns. Steps back, throws, and the pass is knocked away, incomplete around midfield. Almost intercepted. The intended receiver, Trent Kearns. Good but, job uh, that time for Carnegie Mellon's defense against uh, seeing some reserves coming into the ball game. But fourth and ten now. Michael Madelon on the coverage. Fourth and ten, Waynesburg on its own 15. And it seems a punt will get underway. Caden Roberts, the punter for Waynesburg, and back deep for CMU. A couple players, one of which is Chris Hughes, and the other, Ben Armbrester. Punts away. It's not going to get past the 45, and a fair catch called by Ben Armbrester. 
which will set up CMU in or on Waynesburg's half of the field. First and 10 from Waynesburg's 41-yard line. And we talked about last year, Carnegie Mellon eight wins, three losses, one in the ECAC Bowl and two PAC losses um, to a couple of opponents, Grove City and Bethany, both of those games on the road. Last year, Waynesburg in the 10-game slate, one and nine, their only win in homecoming last year against Teal College. That game, you and I called that game, 14-13 final, Waynesburg winning it on a blocked extra point by Tyler Smith. Ben Mills still in the backfield. There's motion by Armbrester, the receiver, and it'll be a pass to Armbrester. He's running toward the 40, gets a nice block, and will gain a few extra yards on that play. Well done by CMU's Zachary Hamilton. Another thing that CMU's doing well, too, and you'll see it right here on the replay, wide open is Armbrester in the flat, but two, three guys getting out in front of Armbrester. You see the offensive lineman pulling over there as well. Ty Splatholtz, the center, as well as the H-back, Spencer Turling, getting out in front, hustling, and creating space for guys like Armbrester as they make catches in the flat or on screen passes. Yeah, I made a mistake, too. That wasn't... Uh that wasn't Zachary Hamilton. That was Spencer Turling, the one who blocked for Armbrester. The ball's free. What'd I say? And it seems that Waynesburg has fallen on it. Yes, the referee's point. Waynesburg has the football back. The football was recovered by Waynesburg's Brandon and Tenku. And Tenko. Yep. There's the replay. Converging on Bicklage. Ball pops out. Oh, hello, football, says Brandon Tenko. Falls right on it. Let's watch it one more time as Jeremiah Miller fast. Rather, rewinds, I should say. I almost messed it up again. But good ball awareness from Tanko. And I said, Waynesburg has got to get the turnover. Keep the spirits up. They do, and they take over offensively. Tyler Raines hands off to Justin Flack, who has some space up the middle. It's brought down by a swarm of CMU players at the bottom of the pile. Skyler Blacker. All right, if I, had gains, to, second down. if I had to one-up myself, I, I set a lofty goal for the Jackets to get a turnover. They did. Next lofty goal coming from Jack Hillgrove. A 20-plus yard run from Justin Flack. Welcome back. Yeah, well, it is Flack still in the backfield next to, next to Reigns. Fake handoff to Flack and throw, and it's knocked away. Well defended by Mason Tolliver. Yeah. of CMU. Inside linebacker playing out in the far side flat doing a good job. And Oh, I, miss, I missed it again. It's Colton con Thomas. Yeah, story continues regardless. Players for Carnegie Mellon doing a tremendous job on the Waynesburg receivers, not giving them any room to work. Makes it difficult for Tyler Raines too. Three interceptions. Reigns in the backfield, throws, pass is caught. It's a great throw. By the near side, Trenton Kearns makes the catch and then is guided out of bounds That's a by Jack Koscho That's and a first down for Waynesburg. It's a well-timed ball. You'll see it right here. Out route to Kearns, right into his bread basket. Well-timed, well-ran route by Kearns, and the Jackets go no huddle. Justin Flack still to the right of Tyler Reigns in the backfield. Trips on the right side of the line. Option play is fumbled and into the hands of CMU. Brought in by Ben Coyne, the lineman of CMU. It was an option play. Tyler Raines wanted to keep the ball. Justin Flack wanted to clamp on it. And that results in a loose football, which CMU recovers. And they will be on offense again. Once again, starting on Waynesburg's half of the field. First down. Does that go down in the books as an interception? Here's the replay. No, he bobbled it. But the ball went forward almost. It didn't hit the ground. Right into the hands of the quarterback range. You'll see it one more time as we rewind. Just a failed option. Yep. Into and out of his hands. And Ben Coyne, right place, right time. You know, that happens all the time. Like when I would play NCAA 14 and I would pitch the ball, there'd be a guy right there and he would just catch it and take it to the other end. It's almost what that was. Pass caught by Ben Armbrester. Inside the 10, it'll find space to score the touchdown. Ben Armbrester, another touchdown reception for Carnegie Mellon University, and this lead is extended. It's now 43-0 CMU in the middle of a shutout against Waynesburg right now. Yeah, shutout, a blowout, whatever you want to call it. Here's a turnover from Coyne, or rather recovering the fumble. Well-timed throw across the middle to Armbrester. 
catching touchdown number one on the season, or rather number two on the season, I should say. He had one in the first half as the extra point is up and good for Carnegie Mellon, which makes it 44-0. But defense and offense, it's not the first time we've seen that tonight from CMU. CMU on that pass, they had a new quarterback in the game, Jack Fierro. What? was the one that threw that ball. Ben Mills now out of the game, so that's a third-string quarterback in the game. Now, J.D. Dayhoff hasn't been in the game yet. He is the usual starter for CMU. Ben Mills, the backup as a freshman, was quarterback for most of the games, but throwing that touchdown pass, Jack Jack Fierro, who is a sophomore, 6'5", 200 pounds, another player on this team from the state of California. Yeah, a lot of them. Um you know, my next project will be, I'm going to count how many different states players from Carnegie Mellon. Go for it. Why not? But I heard uh, Georgia, Connecticut, California, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, and, and more. So CMU getting ready to kick off again to Waynesburg. Waynesburg trailing by 44 points. After the extra point was good. Kicker still Hayden Harrison. Or excuse me. Hayden, yeah, Hayden Harrison. For CMU and back deep to return for Waynesburg. Still Howie Metzger Jr. and Monroe Moeller. 10.47 left in the third quarter. Harrison's kick is rather deep into the hands of Howard Metzger Jr. And he'll take it toward the 25. Still has some space, still on his feet, and he's brought down short of the 30. So Waynesburg with respectable field position to start this drive. Tommy Corey was the one on the tackle for, excuse me, Donald DeCaro. No, 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 Tommy Corey was the one on the tackle for Carnegie Mellon University. So it's first down and 10. Waynesburg on offense. The ball, official, the ball officially spotted on Waynesburg's 27. And here's the snap. Tyler Reigns in the backfield. Screen pass to Nick Hall, but he's brought down quickly. Nick Hall brought down by CMU's Bobby Corey. A loss on the play, second down. All right, quick total. So CMU has two players from Washington, D.C., which is not a state, obviously. The district, it's the District though. of Columbia. But out of the 50 United States of America, 18 of them are represented on Carnegie Mellon's football roster. Wow, 18 states. And two players from D.C., Reigns pass is caught. Brought down around the 25-yard line. Trenton Kearns, the receiver, and on the tackle for CMU. Tommy Corey again. Which there's some talk. Drew Rhea, our spotter, is... Actually, let's give him a shameless plug. If you are living in the 60th district of the PA house, what would that be? What area would that be, Drew? Armstrong, Butler, and Indiana. Andrew Rhea is running for that PA House seat. District 60 is the Libertarian nominee. He is on the ballot, and the special election is May 18th as Waynesburg converts on a first down. Sean Brennan, the one on the catch. It's close to the first down. The first down marker is on Waynesburg's 38. Take a look at the Take a look at the so replay. Waynesburg's going to get 15 extra yards at the end of this play as Brennan makes a tough catch across the middle. 15 yards favors Waynesburg's field position, and it'll put them into Carnegie Mellon territory. This might be the first time the game in the F game that that's at happened. At least, I, I, they, uh, yeah. It has to, yeah, it has to be. I mean, I, I think that they got pretty darn close their first offensive possession of the game, but nonetheless, this is the farthest they've been down the field in a very long time. Ben Howell, the running back next to Reigns, but Reigns elects to throw, and it's brought in by Sean Brennan. Tackled again by Tommy Corey. Gain of roughly eight on the play. That'll set up second down. The ball officially spotted on CMU's 41, and the first down marker is on CMU's 38. Yeah, the Corey brothers, shout out to them for Carnegie Mellon, both freshmen. Tommy, who you just said made the tackle, the backup strong safety. Bobby, the backup weak uh, side inside linebacker. Two freshmen hailing from Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Hand off to Justin Flack back in the game at running back, and he will gain enough for the first down for Waynesburg. Brought down around CMU's 37. Flack 
So the chains will move. A new set of downs for Waynesburg, first and 10. And the ball is spotted on the 37. Waynesburg gets a score in this game. It's 44 to nothing. CMU leads. Justin Fleck now to the left of Tyler Raines in the backfield. Or excuse me, that's Ben Howell, the running back, but it's an option play. Reigns keeps it, gains roughly three on the play before being brought down on CMU's 35. Second down. Good tackle there, and Tommy Corey getting involved. So Ben Howell remains in the game. We haven't seen Ben Howell yet in the backfield, but he is a five foot six junior from Flushing, Ohio, went to Union Local High School. Yeah, seven carries, 20 yards last week. Again, Justin Flack not playing last week, so the two primary ball carriers, Nick Hall and Ben Howe, as a flag flies. And well, range throw almost intercepted yep. in and out of the hands of Michael Madeline. The flag flew right as the snap was. We'll see, yep. Just hit him on the inside of the shoulder. An, an illegal formation on yep. Waynesburg University, so that will push them back. So that play is going to hurt Waynesburg anyway. Actually, if that was intercepted, CMU probably would have declined the penalty. So Well, they declined the penalty think, anyway. All right, well, third down, so they won't take the yardage. They'll just take the down. So it's third and roughly seven. Ball spotted on CMU's 34-yard line. 7.31 left in the third quarter. Ben Howell still in the game to the right of Tyler Raines, the quarterback. Raines in the backfield, throws middle, and it's caught by Tommy Corey. He has it in his hands, and the referees will rule interception on that play. So Tyler Raines with yet another interception thrown in this game. CMU gets the ball back. That was the closest that Waynesburg, or that was the farthest that Waynesburg got in CMU's territory all game. First time they've been on that half of the field, but this drive ends in an interception. And CMU will go back to offense up 44 points. Yeah, good job there by Corey across the middle as Reigns planted. I mean, there was really nobody in the vicinity for Waynesburg, really anywhere close. And Corey was just right place, right time. Fourth interception of the ball game for Tyler Reigns. And CMU takes over. Motion. Fierro still in the game for... CMU at the quarterback position, but a handoff there. That's a sizable gain on the play, second down. Ball carried for CMU by Spencer Turling. Did I correct myself? That's not Sterling. Oh, my goodness. Ryan Shaw on the carry for CMU. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of guys that weren't listed on the two deep for Carnegie Mellon. What, 44 nothing? in this ball game. Fierro, the quarterback, gets the snap and hands off to Shaw. Being chased, finds some space. That's a first down for CMU and some more as he goes toward midfield. And he's knocked out of bounds right around midfield. So a new set of downs for CMU. It's first and 10. Yeah, you, you'll see it right here. The CMU sideline getting hyped up on that play right there. Ooh. A big stiff arm right into the face mask of Luke Mengus. And uh, that's a big play as he was able to get another yard or two, and it got the CMU boys on the near sideline hyped up. But again, and another another good job for uh, Carnegie Mellon to make some space offensively. Similar play here. Shaw, the ball carrier, is brought down after a gain of about eight on the play. And CMU now on Waynesburg's half of the field. Yeah, they're moving it well down the field. Carnegie Mellon all night, and there you see the defensive line for Waynesburg. Joel Zellum seeing some time, another Department of Communication student. Number 65 rocking those orange cleats as he heads into that three-point stance over the ball. Jack Fierro still the quarterback. Motion again from the same slot man, and this time it's a fake. Fierro throws downfield, passes, knocked out of the hands. That CMU receiver, the intended receiver for CMU was Ethan Reifer. Yeah, Mahalik, good defense on that play. Arm breaster, you'll see it right here. Play action, a good throw from the CMU quarterback, but Mahalik covering the receiver very, very well. 
getting a hand over top. That left hand reaching over without drawing any contact or any laundry. Textbook clean play. WNJ leading Washington and Jefferson 20 to 6. That's the other game in the PAC today. Only two games in the PAC. False and that start. was handed off on uh, handoff to Shaw, but a flag came down. Full start on CMB. Yeah, so that's I'm back. And did I? I said you, Washington leads Jefferson. Yes, Washington <laughs> and Jefferson. Oh goodness. Leads Geneva. Okay, yeah, Washington and Jefferson leading Geneva 20 to six. Another shameless plug back to the podcast. But did you know Doc Emmerich, early on in his career, taught broadcasting and speech at Geneva College in I, Beaver Falls? I did not know that. He did. So the same formation here. That same guy has gone in motion. Ryan Shaw. Trips as Farrow gets hit. Uh, it's going to be a late hit on the quarterback, I think, as that flag flew in late from the flag flew in from the referee Barker, the lead official. But yeah, Emrick earned his PhD. Said, I, you know, if I can't make it in hockey, let me earn some PhD money. Got a job teaching at Gene Geneva, and then in addition to that, got his start in the NHL. As you see the replay, we'll watch this late hit. I mean, how late is that? So Caleb Stevens of Waynesburg has been disqualified on that yep. play. Though, call it. Uh, oh yeah, he let. Yeah, okay. I was gonna say I'm not sure how late of a hit that was. As we zoom in, oh yeah, he leaned. Oh, that's that's helmet to helmet. That is about his textbook targeting. And, and normally, if it's one of those plays where they need to review it, they'll come review it. But no need to review that. At all. Motion again. Hand off to Shaw. And he'll be brought down by a swarm of Waynesburg players. Short gain on the play. Sets up second down. A couple players in there on the tackle. One of them for Waynesburg was Tyler Metzger. Waynesburg using some flexible defense. They use the anchor who either plays in the flat or goes up on the line and charges depending on whatever play they want to use, but Waynesburg set up in what can be classified as a 4-4 defensive structure. Yeah, it's one of those things where that anchor position can create a, a bunch of different fronts, 3-3-5, three, 4-3, three, 4-2-5 four, three, four, if they switch to nickel, but any time that Metzger at that anchor position lines up as a timeout is called, any time they line up on the defensive line, you'll see the front three. Uh, on the depth chart coming into the game, it was Nemec, Donnelly, and Stevens. Um, you'll see those guys. You'll see those guys line up bunched, and then Metzger lines out on the outside. So that anchor position creates a, a lot of variables for Waynesburg defensively. Timeout called by Carnegie Mellon University. We'll take a quick, quick break here on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Forty-four nothing. CMU leads Waynesburg. Fierro throws, and the pass is dropped. Ryan Shaw, the intended receiver for CMU. Now oh, I misidentified again. Going too soon. Eric Peterson, the intended receiver, dropped the pass. So it's now third down and about eight. Four minutes, 32 seconds left in the third quarter. It's 44 to nothing. Waynesburg is trailing CMU. Fierro is still in his quarterback, motion by Peterson. And there's the snap, fake handoff, throw goes downfield, the pass is caught by CMU's receiver, Ethan Reifer. And a new set of downs for CMU as they're inside Waynesburg's 20 now, first and 10. There goes the offense for Carnegie Mellon. 
Still, uh, still chugging away. No there. signs of holding up. And there they go. They're going quickly on offense now. Ryan Shaw still in the backfield. He's behind the quarterback. For CMU, Fierro bobbled a bit. Now the fake handoff to Shaw. Fierro gets brought down quickly. Good play. Oh. And a flag on the play as the tackle was made by Waynesburg's Jared Grove. Are they going to get Grove for a penalty here? Oh, take a look at the replay. See what could be. It's Fierro. He bobbled it for a second. Then Shaw missed the handoff. Oh, no. The personal foul against unnecessary roughness against uh, Carnegie Mellon. I was going to say, there's the way that was timed and where the official was that threw the flag. You see uh, the referee throwing the flag right next to the tackle. I thought maybe that that was going to go against Grove, and uh, it didn't. And a, a little bit of timeout here for injury as Carnegie Mellon brings a player to the sideline. It looks like. Is that Hughes, the receiver? The player seems okay. By the way, there's CMU resets. A new quarterback is into the game for CMU. Taking the position. I'll tell you in a minute. Is that Handoff there, Ryan Shaw on the carry. He's brought down. But it's not Mills, and it's not Dayhoff. I see number nine. But no rostered players, number nine. Replay comes up. Ryan Shaw look barreling through Jarrett Grove. Gain a few extra yards. Watch it there. Jarrett Grove's number 39. Just kind of ran him over a bit while being tackled from behind. But CMU third and goal from Waynesburg's 15. Motion, handoff. Again, Shaw on the carry. He's brought down inside the tent. Well, you know, that's interesting. So it's not Dayhoff, because Dayhoff is number 12, obviously. We've already seen number 15, Ben Mills. Jack Fierro, we just saw, was number 18. This quarterback, number 9, process of elimination, as you see him on the pump fake there. The only other listed quarterback on the roster that we haven't seen is Kyle Robertson, who's listed on this roster as number 14. So that would almost have to be, yeah, there you see number nine. We don't have a number nine on this roster for Carnegie Mellon. We'll go with Robinson. We're going to go Robertson. with Robertson. Sophomore from and a time Aliso, out. Viejo, California. Time I called by Waynesburg. So, not much to recap in terms of scoring in this game. The score is 44 to nothing. A combination, combination of punts, interceptions, turnovers of... Uh, hurt Waynesburg. We'll take a quick break here on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. I'm Nicholas Callis, Jack Kilgrove here. The score is 44 to nothing. We'll see you after the break. Piracy is a crime. If you see someone downloading copyrighted material without paying for it, then you should inform the authorities immediately. If you download any copyrighted material from the internet without paying for it, then you should go to jail. Welcome back to the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Kyle Robertson, the quarterback. Motion. CMU's going to go for it. A handoff to Shaw. But he's brought down rather quickly, so that'll be a turnover on downs for CMU. It was fourth and goal on that play. Now Waynesburg back on offense. A yeah, good job here of the Waynesburg defense. You see them converge right to where the hole was as soon as the handoff was made. A good job there for the defensive front for Waynesburg. But, uh, you know, the, the slipperiness of the ball carrier there for CMU gets away and Brett Hicks awaits. There's not like the, the the assignments that are need to be made for Waynesburg right now on these run plays are being made and the gaps are being kept in check and they've really done that all evening in the run game except for uh, that one run by Bickledge as we have a quarterback change double back set for Waynesburg Mason Schrenker fakes the handoff and throws to Matt Craig who gets taken down the ball likely to be spotted around the ten forward progress on that play but Matt Craig on the reception.
So second down and five on the play. Matt Craig was apparently just about fumbled it. But according to the officials, he caught it, so nothing changes there. Second yeah, and was, five from Waynesburg's 11. He was down before um, still any a fumble could have been made. Still a double back set. Nick Hall and Justin Flack in the backfield. Schranker fakes to Flack now, pitches out to Nick Hall, who is wrapped up quickly and brought down. The first player for CMU to make that tackle was Michael Madeline. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how much I get that play call. Um, like, I, you know, I'm not a football expert, but the, that option type of play has been nowhere near uh, this Waynesburg playbook at all this season. And, you know, there's nothing that really Schrenker could have made a better read. I mean, they just, Carnegie Mellon converged, and they were there, and uh, there was no way that, you know, if Schrenker keeps or elects to pitch that, it, uh, it it goes in either way. Good job defensively for uh, the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. Now only one back, three receivers to the left side of the line. Pass play, Schrenker finds pressure. He runs back into the end zone, finds time, throws downfield. The pass is way over the head of Howie Metzger, the intended receiver. So incomplete pass. And now it's fourth down and ten. So Waynesburg continuing to struggle offensively, no score, or no amount of points on Waynesburg's point total right now. CMU at 44 points, 44 nothings to score. Waynesburg hasn't scored in their first two games of the season up to this point. They got shut out 66 to nothing by Washington at Jefferson College. Now losing to Carnegie Mellon University. Caden Roberts to punt for Waynesburg and a couple new return players back to Anticipate the punt return. There it's taken around the 40 and the 45. The returner brought down for CMU returning that punt was Adrian Williams, a freshman. So a variety of players getting into the game yep. now as uh, this game is unbalanced on the scoreboard. But back to that back to that play that Schranker made, and you know, Tyler Raines has the, the division one frame and the build, a taller guy, but Schranker's been around this team. Uh, this field, for that matter, and you know, has a little more experience starting for Chris Smithley's team more often, and that's just a veteran play. The confidence to be able to backtrack into the end zone, risky play, right? Trying to uh, avoid a safety and exposes that risk. But he kept his composure, kept his poise, delivered a good off-balance throw downfield. It was just a little off the mark for Howie Metzger to get up and try and make a catch. Kyle Robertson still the quarterback, and he hands off to Ryan Shaw. A significant gain on the play there. Second down. Uh, roughly a gain of four on the play. Ball will be spotted around the 30. CMU in Waynesburg's territory. CMU's been on Waynesburg's half of the field for most of this game. As you see the score, quarter about to expire. Carnegie Mellon University leads Waynesburg University 44 to nothing. We'll get to the fourth quarter. Right after this break, you're watching the Waynesburg University Sports Network. <laughs> It's a Saturday night. You know what that means. Time to party. Sam is having a good time. Watching sports, drinking beer, playing Pong. Not a care in the world for Sam. Nobody at the party stops Sam. They let him walk out the door with his keys even though he was stumbling having a hard time to stand up. What happened less than 10 minutes later? would change Sam's life forever. Welcome back to the Waynesburg University Sports Network. I'm Nicholas Callis, Jack Hilgrove with me here. Waynesburg trailing by a large amount. First play of the fourth quarter is a Kyle Robertson handoff to Ryan Shaw. So now it's third down, roughly two to go. For the first down, CMU well into Waynesburg's territory. Another handoff to Shaw. Find space, makes a move, gains some open space, hurdles. And he's brought down around the 20-yard line. That's good enough for a first down for CMU. 
Ron Waynesburg's red zone now. Four minutes, 15 seconds left I really in the like, quarter. I really like the play, and you see him on your screen there, of Braden Mahalik. Uh, listed on the depth chart as the backup cornerback to Vinny San Martino, the senior from uh, St. Clairsville, Ohio. But he's been a very, very good player this evening. You saw him converge on the tackle there, and he's uh, been a good player in, in pass coverage as well. Putting blankets on these CMU receivers when he's given the opportunity. Kyle Robertson again, a handoff to Ryan Shaw, finds space, and he's brought down. First player there for Waynesburg was Luke Mangus. Gain of roughly five on the play, sets up second down. Check this out, though. Just good space. Good job by the offensive line to create that hole, and Ryan Shaw does well. Staying on his feet, just fighting and gaining yards. He almost saw the, the strip from the Waynesburg defender there trying to force a fumble, but just couldn't do it. Good job. Carnegie Mellon able to hold on to the football. Now another halfback into the game for CMU. It's Zachary Hamilton, a sophomore on this CMU team. Motion by Peterson, number 89, and now a handoff. Up the middle. That'll be close to the first down as the ball crosses the 10, and number 30, the running back brought down Hamilton around the 5. Brought down by number but yeah, Zachary Hamilton on the carry again, just under 13 minutes left in the fourth quarter. So now that will be a first down for CMU. The ball spotted around the five in Waynesburg's territory. Kyle Robertson in the backfield and Ryan Shaw will get the carry this time in place of Hamilton who got the last carry. Ryan Shaw brought down that one We'll go for a loss on the player, a loss of roughly two. That'll set up second down and goal from the seven. Again, a, a variety of players in the game for CMU. Zachary Hamilton got a couple carries so far. Six-foot sophomore from Washington, New Jersey. Third down and goal from the seven. Robertson calls for motion. And it'll be a handoff to Ryan Shaw pushing. And he's brought down past the five-yard line. So now fourth down for CMU. Excuse me, third down. Flag comes in late. Ten-yard penalty. Still second down. Holding. Backs things up for Carnegie Mellon. And the Jackets catch a break. Chris Smithley and company elect to accept the penalty, as they should. And back things up. And so second and goal from the 17. Yep. Waynesburg has not scored, see my math here, seven consecutive quarters. That would be correct. Because there's four this quarters is, yeah, in a football is, game. This yeah. is the eighth one. It's quarter number eight, they still have yet to score. They got shut up by Washington and Jefferson last week, 66 nothing, and now they're losing 44 nothing. Here is Ryan Shaw. Gets the handoff. He'll be brought down after a pretty significant gain and a late flag on the play. Quick call from the head referee. They've given up 110 points. Holding. Offense. Another holding Number call. 79. Back him up. Beep. Second down. Beep. Beep. So still second down, but new rules coming in the PAC this year and new standings, new alignments. It's the South Division and the North Division. There are eight teams participating in football this season in the PAC. Two elected to skip out on this spring season, Case Western Reserve and Teal. Kyle Robertson in the backfield as the quarterback. And Hamilton now in the backfield for CMU. No, it's Ryan Shaw again. Sorry about that. But Ryan Shaw gets the carry. He'll be brought down on a short game. That'll set up third and goal from Waynesburg's roughly 25. You know, we talk but, about, and it's a shame because Carnegie Mellon only in the PAC the for football. But, I mean, it's a university that has, I mean, national recognition. Their endowment's just under $3 billion. And the, the alumni from Carnegie Mellon, you know how when you, you prep for a, a game and you look, you, if you're doing a high school or college, there's a page on the Wikipedia spot for notable alumni? Well, for Carnegie Mellon, there's a separate page 
Wikipedia page for Carnegie Mellon alumni and people associated with the university. Yeah, for me, Ted Danson comes to mind, Andy Warhol. Yep. A couple notables is Ryan Shaw on that carry. Fourth down. Fourth down and a long way to the goal line for CMU. Four people winning the National Medal of Science. Kyle Robertson still in the game as quarterback. The third quarterback we've seen playing in this game, J.D. Dayhoff, the typical starter, has not played a down or a snap in this game. Ryan Shaw with the carry again. CMU just went for it. No field goal attempted there. So they will turn the ball over on downs. First down for Waynesburg inside its own 15. Back to the PAC alignments. Right now, Waynesburg is in the South Division with St. Vincent, Washington, and Jefferson, and Bethany. Waynesburg right now tied with Bethany, 0-1 records in the PAC. This game you're watching right now was scheduled to be played on March the 19th. Every team had a, had a non-divisional game as their first game, and then their next three were supposed to be against their divisional opponents, but this game got postponed because of COVID complications, so Waynesburg played Washington and Jefferson in its first game of the season last Friday, March the 26th. And now they're playing in game two, so this game won't count toward any PAC records, so to speak. It won't count toward their divisional record, but it will count against their overall. Run there by Waynesburg. Ben Howell on holding. the carry. But a flag on the play holding on the offense. It was Ben Howell on the carry, but that carry will turn void as the holding penalty will march Waynesburg back. Since they're within their own 20, the Yellow Jackets will go half the distance to the goal, so that'll put the ball at, the, at Waynesburg's five. First and 15 now. Back to the famous alumni for Carnegie Mellon. Their most impressive and their most famous of people fall under the category on this oh, Wikipedia on page of like acting or in fine That's arts. Like um, Ethan Hawke was briefly at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Joe Maganello, a Pittsburgh native, Pittsburgh actor on True Blood. Also on the carry. Also on the Big carry. time Steelers fan, native of Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Leslie Odom, starring in the Broadway musical Hamilton. He's also appearing and has a large role in the Many Saints of Newark, which is a Sopranos prequel movie, which comes out this fall on HBO Max, and I believe it's going to theaters as well. Hand off to Howe by Mason Schranker, and he'll be brought down quickly by a swarm of Carnegie Mellon University defenders. That has me fired up too, by the way. If you have some any free time in the next couple weeks, do you have HBO Max? No. Oh. I would invest, oh, and I would binge watch The Sopranos. It is probably, I, I go back and forth between that and Breaking Bad for my all-time favorite TV shows. So CMU set up, they've got a new defensive formation. They've got a, looks like a 4-3 now, but four rushers against the five Waynesburg offensive linemen. Mason Trenker still playing quarterback with Ben Howell to his right. Pass play, long pass downfield, and it's over the head of the intended receiver, Brendan Tavarich. Shrinker's pass intended for Brendan Tavarich. And that'll set up now a fourth down. And roughly 14 for the first down. The ball spotted on Waynesburg's nine, and the first down marker is at the 23-yard line. Yeah, Waynesburg, or rather Brendan Tavarich, relatively quiet today. Um, emerged late last year as one of the top receivers for the Jackets. Last week, three catches for 44 yards. But the timeout called by yeah, Waynesburg. Ahead. Sorry. Riley Holsinger's telling us to go to a break, so we should probably go to a break. This is the Waynesburg University <laughs> Sports Network. Waynesburg lead, or losing 44 to nothing in this football game. We'll be back. We're going to fade up to uh, camera three in five, four, three, two, one, take it.
This is the Waynesburg University Sports Network. I'm Nicholas Callis, Jack Hillgrove. With me and Andrew Ree, also in the booth, our statistician and spotter, Caden Roberts, the punter for Waynesburg. Well, punt it away now. I'm going to go to CMU. Oh, boy. Well, that punt started in Wayne. The, the punt return started in Waynesburg's half of the field, and the return man for CMU. Adrian Williams. This punt and Jeremiah Miller's running replay is a big Penn State fan. This return reminds me of the KJ Hamler punt return in the Pitt Penn State game in 20, what would that have been, 2018 at Heinz Field. When it was just a low line drive up near midfield, Hamler caught it and ran straight to the end zone untouched. It wasn't that quite. So oh, see, now Jeremiah's – I thought it was Hamler. It was DeAndre Tompkins, but he's the Penn State fan, and I was the Pitt fan, incredibly uninterested in that 56 – was it 50 uh, – what was it, 56-10? Oh, 56-6. 51-6. See, I don't even remember. Kyle Robertson still the quarterback for CMU. Ryan Shaw. Well, it's not Ryan Shaw. I saw the two, but there's a one next to that two. Number 21. Trey Vasilaitis is the one on the carry. So another halfback into the game. So we've seen a few halfbacks as well. Luke Bicklage, Ryan Shaw, Zach Zachary Hamilton. Hey, man, kudos and to now, you. Yeah, and now uh, now Trey Vasilaitis. Oh, man. I was going to give you credit. I thought you looked up at the roster and nailed the pronunciation without no. looking at the key. But nope. You cheated and looked I at the key. I did cheat. That's okay. But Vasilaitis, once again, on the carry. So they're within goal line range right now. Second down and goal is the situation for CMU after that carry. They're within the five on Waynesburg's side of the field. I correct myself. It's actually first down. Hand off once again to Vasilaitis. Another touchdown for CMU. The score is now 50 to nothing. I mean, good moves there. Found the hole, pushed through a little bit. You need that extra strength as a running back to push through some defenders. And yeah, That's a good block on the uh, linebacker, Brett Hicks, for Carnegie Mellon, I believe. That was... Hunter Campbell, freshman center from Downers Grove, Illinois, on the block. Just pinned Hicks down and was able to free up for a touchdown. Well, and, Brett Hicks is the one. Brett, Brett Hicks is the one who's on the ground right now for Waynesburg. He's down on an injury, being aided by a couple of the training staff members. I mean, but it looked like, yeah, let's watch this replay one more time. Hicks coming from the left side of your screen and then in. Right there, 25. It, Ooh. I think what happened was Zach Zaransky, the 6'2", 250-pound junior center into the game, as he was blocked down from up top. And there you see he's up under with some help from Andy Palco and the training staff and Eric McDowell not putting any – yeah, that's exactly what happened. Not putting any weight on that left leg. Um Zoransky just kind of caught underneath, and it was an incidental high-low. So Hicks is aided off the field. Hopefully uh, that injury is not too serious for him. Brett Hicks, as we mentioned, we talked about him earlier in the broadcast, has been a key part in the middle of that defense. He's a junior and, and has been a key part of the middle of that linebacking core since his freshman year, the junior out of Chartiers Valley. Um, and, you know, an injury like that isn't something that you want to see uh, in a game that's 50 to nothing going the other way. So hopefully for Waynesburg and Brett Hicks' sake, he's okay. Hayden Hairston. Despite all the changes CMU has had in this game, they've kept their kicker consistent. Hayden Hairston puts up point. and makes another extra point. That makes the score 51-0. to zero. Six minutes, 20 seconds left. In the fourth quarter, and uh, Jack was talking about some HBO shows, The Sopranos, he recommends. But let's talk about some of the shows that WCTV has. Sure. The Nerd Alert. Yeah. Great, great show. Got to watch that. Uh, hey, Riley, when does that, uh, that show premiere? Let me know if you know. Uh, yep. An episode Isn't premiered a couple yep. weeks ago. They just talk about uh, some shows and movies and other things that are going around that uh, – 
that you should be aware of. We also got Jacket Sports Weekly, where, or actually it's not bi weekly because it happens every two weeks now, but uh, check that out to get recaps on all Waynesburg sports. Uh, right now, the top sports going on tennis, uh, men's and women's tennis, men's and women's track and field, softball, baseball, football. That's what you're watching right now. Check out that show, the newscast. Get an update on everything going around in the world and around Waynesburg and Waynesburg University's campus. That usually gets to YouTube on Wednesdays at some point. Got a variety of shows on WCTV and we're working to get it back on cable and with our new high definition equipment. Equipment. And right now you're watching Waynesburg University Sports Network in high definition. Last week was our first high definition broadcast with all of our new equipment. This is our second. But WCTV and other Waynesburg Department of Communication assets are moving to high definition. That ball kicked off by Harrison and brought in around the 20 by Waynesburg. The return coming now by Howie Metzger. He trips a bit, crosses the 30, and he's knocked out of bounds. So a uh, decent return there for Waynesburg to start this drive, but they're down by 51. They have not scored yet this season. That's, that's pretty big. And one of the more impressive things in uh, that I've seen this university been able to put together, and they did it so quickly. I mean, I remember looking at the initial announcement on Twitter of the new video board, and within 48 hours, it was built. And it is awesome. And I wasn't able to be here last week. There you see it on your screen. I wasn't able to be here last week due to cool. some quarantine complications. But that thing is awesome. And it's the first time I've seen it tonight in action, and it has been uh, a, a tremendous addition for us to be able to utilize that with the Department of Communication as Mason Schranker fumbles the snap and is tackled. But not only for us, for the athletics department. I mean, you know, I, when the funding was uh, given to this scoreboard, and I'll continue talking after you watch Mason Schranker. Good reaction, able to see it quickly that it was a high snap. And again, uh, Schranker able to fall on it and keep it. But I wrote the original article on the video board when it was announced that it was going to be funded and done. And uh, athletic director Adam Jack said, you know, this is going to breach out far beyond athletics. Um, Post-COVID, they plan to do movie nights, uh, put a movie up on the screen and invite kids to lay out on the turf and watch it, uh, which is a pretty cool concept, as well as, you know, sc uh, scout groups and things of that nature to be able to come. Not only is it good for Waynesburg Athletics, but good for the community as a whole. And uh, Nathan Grella, a sophomore sports information student, has been working heavily involved, and Alan uh, Miller of IT Services has been uh, coordinating this whole thing, and they're using our replays. That replay that you just saw was up on the board, and, um, it's a it's a really cool addition to see uh, for Waynesburg University, and also Adam Jack said too, maybe someday, a couple years down the road, video board like this could be implemented in the Rudy Marisa Fieldhouse. Mason Tranker in the backfield for Waynesburg, getting swarmed, stays on his feet though after having pressure applied. Now throws downfield. The pass is around the sideline and it is ruled incomplete. Matt Craig, the intended receiver for Waynesburg. But an incomplete pass, and it's now fourth down and 12 for Waynesburg on its own 28. Yeah, you'll see it here, Schrenker able to stay on his feet. Good stuff from the senior from Montour. Good throw to the sideline, good catch from Matt Craig, but that play's so bang, bang and, and fast-paced that it's really tough for Schrenker to be able to give him a good enough throw to keep the feet inbounds, and Craig's improvising at that point and able to keep his feet inbounds on the catch. It was looked really close. Um, from that angle, you can't really tell if he got the foot, and he might have. But again, Time yeah, that it, plays so um, one, two, bang, bang, that it's just hard to tell, and Waynesburg calls its final timeout of the evening. Yeah, Alex Torrance was the center, then Eric McDowell ran in, and then Waynesburg and all the confusion called a timeout. Four minutes, 40 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Four, fourth down and 12 is the situation right now. Waynesburg still scoreless through two games. 51 to nothing is the score now. Uh, we repeated this uh, significantly throughout the broadcast. Waynesburg lost last week 66 to nothing against uh, Washington and Jefferson. Waynesburg has two more South Division opponents to play. St. Vincent and Bethany are the two teams. Bethany is winless this season. They're 0-1 in division, 0-2. 
0-2 in the uh, uh, overall. Waynesburg 0-1 on both records divisionally and overall. This game against CMU will not count toward their PAC record or their divisional record as that ball's punted away. And CMU elects to just let that punt roll as far as it will. It'll be down to around the 40-yard line in CMU's own territory. But uh, a newly designed season here. The crossover game will feature a team from each division of uh, the seeding playing each other. So the one seed will play the one seed in the north, play the one seed in the south. Which is a and cool it'll go concept. Down four, uh, and it'll go down uh, as that as well. But uh, this game will not count toward the Standings where the that apply to the crossover event that'll be happening on uh, April the 23rd. At least it's scheduled for that day. Uh, final score two in the Washington and Jefferson and Geneva game, 20 to six. The final Washington and Jefferson won that game. But I was I was going to say as well. I, I hope that and you know they wanted to modify things and it, they've been modified everywhere because of COVID as Carnegie Mellon breaks off a decently sized run here on first down but I hope that post COVID and hopefully if things get back to normal in the PAC in the fall that they stick around with you know top two teams in the conference squaring off at the end of the season I think the concept of a conference championship game especially since you know the PAC isn't very often well represented in the national tournament at the Division Three level. I mean, you'll see Case Western and w &J in there every now and again. But I think a more intimate and a more um, closely competitive conference championship game at the end of each season between one and two would be awesome. Kyle Robertson still the quarterback of CMU. Zachary Hamilton in the backfield, and the flag goes down before the snap. So again, we so offsides, or excuse me, false start on CMU. We would like to, uh, you know, apologize again. Um, we're given a roster and a pronunciation guide from the opposition, and a shout out on Twitter to Cynthia Irapoli, quarterback in the game now for Carnegie Mellon number nine is J.P. Irapoli, a freshman from Connecticut. So he has been in the game. We speculated that it was Kyle Robertson. It is not. We thank you for the clarification because uh, unfortunately he's not listed on the roster. J.P. Irapoli. That's uh, number nine now and a handoff goes for a short gain on the play. So now fourth down and roughly five on the play. The ball spotted on the 45 in CMU's own, CMU own territory and the first down marker is at midfield. I take that back. Ira Poli is listed on the roster as number 85. So perhaps a converted wide receiver for the Tartans. Freshman, six foot from Newton, Connecticut. And the CMU will go for it. It's third down and roughly five to go. JP Ira Poli, here's the snap and a handoff. And that rush will be good enough for a first down. Zachary Hamilton again on the carry. And a new set of downs coming again to CMU. Just about two minutes, 20 seconds left in regulation of this game. Scores 51 to zero. CMU leads Waynesburg. And Waynesburg's about to go two straight games without scoring any points. The offense has struggled. Uh, frequent amount of interceptions thrown by Tyler Raines in this game. Mason Tranker has gotten some time here at the end. So not a good look for Waynesburg right now. For CMU, though, several players have gotten into the game and played well. Ben Mills, one of the top players for CMU in this game. He started at quarterback, gave J.D. Dayhoff the day off as that ball is kneeled. But Ben Mills, a freshman who played well in this game, rushed for a few good, uh, good runs, threw a couple passes, too, for touchdowns. Just played well for a guy who's a freshman, and J.D. Dayhoff's a senior, so once he graduates, Ben Mills very well might be the starting quarterback of this team. So a minute 20 left in this fourth quarter of play, and it seems that CMU is just going to kneel out the clock. Yeah. And J.P.I. or Poli, the one still at quarterback. And give them the credit. I mean, they came out to play. You know, I, I questioned coming into this ball game, you know, a lot of people asked, you know, a after the 66 nothing game against W&J last week that um, I thought this one would be a little bit more 
close. I didn't think that Carnegie Mellon, based off of a 14-point performance last week, was able to come out and put up the amount of points and create a margin like this. Give them credit, and uh, that, you know that perhaps is on me. I mean, Rich Lackner has been one of, if not the top um, and most consistent coaches amongst the Division Three level across the country. A 34th year head coach for Carnegie Mellon, and he had his team prepared very well today to come out and score 51 points against these Waynesburg Yellow Jackets. Um, hopefully this wasn't the last home game for Waynesburg. Hopefully the way things line up, they end up playing that crossover game on April 23rd or the 24th here at Wiley Stadium. And if they are, that's the uh, the next time you'll see us on Woosen. But if not, this perhaps could have been it. Well, the clock getting ready to expire. Waynesburg jogs off the field. And let me get my calculator out because math has not been my strong suit tonight. Waynesburg, 117 unanswered points over two games. 66 to nothing shutout against Washington and Jefferson last Friday. And on this Thursday, April the 1st, this is no April Fool's joke. Waynesburg has lost to CMU. 51 to 0. We'll take a quick break here on the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Come back, recap the game, and send you home if you're not already there. Have you ever been to the Everly Library? If not, you should, because it's great. They have books of all different genres. History, biography, fiction. Try The Evolution of Life, Life of Pi, or Jurassic Park. So what if books aren't your thing? Try movies, like Frozen, or TV shows, like Lost. Books and DVDs aren't the only thing, though. Take a trip to the second floor. Welcome to the Writing Center. These tutors will tell you everything you need to know about writing a paper and the help provides your essays. Now let's head back down. Behold, the Knox Learning Center. Need to print something out five minutes before your next class because you procrastinated? No problem. You can also print off pictures of dogs. Because, well, you can. So grab your homework, laptop, and textbook, and study diligently. Bring your lunch, too. Actually, you can't. That's illegal. Now you know the Everly Library. Stop by any time. Seriously, it's open all week. Welcome back to the Waynesburg University Sports Network. I'm Nicholas Callis, Jack Hillgrove with me here. Uh, snow continues to trickle down as Waynesburg has lost their second consecutive game at home. Final score of this one, Carnegie Mellon University 51, Waynesburg University 0. Uh, a struggle again on offense for Waynesburg, uh, and their defense was quite overpowered against the offense of CMU. Jack Hillgrove with some statistics. Yeah, it's all Carnegie Mellon. Um, 228 rushing yards. Waynesburg had a whopping five rushing yards on the ground. Uh, 5.2 yards a carry for Carnegie Mellon this evening. How about .2 for Waynesburg? Uh, passing yards, another good one for Carnegie Mellon, 227, 228 and 227. I call that consistent. Waynesburg had 76 passing yards. Uh, the quarterbacks for Carnegie Mellon, a combined 12 of 23 for those 227. The quarterbacks for Waynesburg, 14 of 30 for those 76 and four interceptions. Waynesburg averaging a whopping 1.5 yards a play. Carnegie Mellon significantly better, around 6.8 yards per play. Uh, five penalties for 54 yards for Waynesburg, nine penalties, 81 yards for Carnegie Mellon. 
Waynesburg punted it six times. Carnegie Mellon punted it twice. Third downs, 14 apiece. Converting eight times, Carnegie Mellon. Converting three times, Waynesburg. 0 for 2 apiece on fourth downs. Time of possession, 35 minutes, 15 seconds for Carnegie Mellon, 24-45 for Waynesburg. As far as individual statistics go, uh, for Tyler Raines of Waynesburg, 67 passing yards, 9 passing yards for Mason Schranker. For rushing, Justin Flack, 24 yards. Nick Hall, 2. Ben Howell, minus 3. For Carnegie Mellon, however, Luke Bickelidge, 92 yards. Ryan Shaw, 91 yards. So a very lethal one-two punch for Carnegie Mellon today. That catapulted them, really, to this 51-point margin of victory give their defense credit too i mean they held waynesburg to a goose egg the second consecutive team to do so but buclidge or a uh, bickelidge i should say ryan shaw bang bang out of the backfield when they came out in the third quarter right away and well, ben mills too well i mean i know it's on the defensive side too but ben mills is quarterback for cmu uh, oh an absolute i mean he, yeah. he, he for not for being a freshman starting this game i mean as weak as waynesburg has looked so far this season to play like he did was also pretty impressive for a freshman quarterback. And with J.D. Dayhoff, the senior quarterback, listed as the number one, um, at least the number one quarterback not playing in this game today, uh, and Ben Mills being the starter and doing what he did, uh, that's quite impressive. Uh, certainly, again, for the, for the freshman quarterback that played the first part of this game for Carnegie Mellon University. As for Waynesburg, still some struggles. Tyler Raines didn't look too sharp. Mason Schreiker didn't either, but Schreiker was in more of garbage time at this point in the game, just getting some repetitions for Reigns, who yeah. struggled toward the beginning part. But uh, that'll do it here. Uh, pending the crossover event, whether Waynesburg will host that game or not will depend on whether we do another production. But uh, for the regular season, so to speak, uh, for the regular football season, this is it for us. Uh, and it's also it for us because Jack and I are seniors and we are likely to graduate Likely, at the end more of, than uh, likely. At the end of this home month, stretch. So, uh, home stretch coming yeah, along. A tremendous, uh, a tremendous thank you and help to Bob and Jay Hawk and Dan uh, Hersa from RPC Video. They've been down here. Uh, Bob helping in the setup for both days. Uh, Jay and Dan down here during the game last week and this week. They've been a tremendous help uh, getting us acclimated to uh, our new high-definition trailer that's going to take uh, this department and the Waynesburg University Sports Network to the next level and put together some quality productions and continue to improve. I wish I could be around for it, yeah. for sure. But uh, uh, tremendous thank you to them. Tremendous thank you to our tremendous faculty. I keep saying tremendous. <laughs> uh, to our faculty, Department Chair Richard Krause, Faculty Advisor Melinda Roeder, uh, our... Um, uh, sports announcing advisor Lanny for Terry for scheduling these games and being patient with us and uh, with all the schedule changes uh, due to COVID. Thanks to our producer this evening, Riley Holsinger, our director, Matt Mansfield, technical director, Matt uh, Adam Morganti, audio, Jared Weicker, graphics, Terry and Allensworth, our camera ops, Joe Venzel, Bruce Davidson, Brock Owens, help from Nick Staso, Jeremiah Miller on replay. If I missed anybody, I am sorry. Drew Rhea, our spotter and statistician, and everybody else that was down here helping set up and getting this done because, uh, you know, quick turnaround. Going to basketball, to football, we were able to do it, and uh, hopefully we're able to do one more in a couple of weeks, uh, either April 23rd or the 24th, that crossover game potentially, either one of those days at John F. Wiley Stadium. All right, yes, for the rest of our crew and Jack Kilgrove, I'm Nicholas Callis. You've been watching this production of the Waynesburg University Sports Network. Stay tuned for that date on the 23rd. Waynesburg might play and we might produce that game and bring it to you. But again, check the news on that. But so long from John F. Wiley Stadium, this has been the Waynesburg University Sports Network. This has been a presentation of the Waynesburg University Sports Network.